I was 21, recently became a police officer, and was recently dumped. So my friend suggested Tinder. As a 21-year-old and a new cop, I had the I'm invincible and I can take on anyone mentality. I matched with a very good-looking, out-of-my-league female. We chatted and eventually set up a date to meet. She said she had a great open field to look up at stars and hang out, and we could meet up at her house. So the night came. I was excited, and she seemed to be excited when I picked her up. She guided me to the field, and it looked nice. Open space, woods, deer, and other wildlife. In the field, I noticed really dim headlights off in the distance. Then, the van started driving towards us. It pulled up in front of my truck, almost close enough to block me from going forward. I told her to stay in the car, and I'd go say hi. I grabbed my flashlight I had in the car and walked up. In the front driver's side of the van, there was a decently sized man. I asked him what's going on and if he could back his car up just a little bit. He was very polite, said he was the owner of the property, and that he didn't mean to scare us. He told me that he's been having trouble with poachers on his property and just wanted to make sure we weren't going to be shooting at anything. I ensured him we only came out to look at some stars and wildlife. He was perfectly okay with that, told me to have a nice night, and drove away. After that, the girl was texting nonstop. Around an hour later, I saw headlights coming towards us again, this time at a really fast pace. We hopped in the car and I moved it to a more defensive position. The same man came close enough to almost hit my car. She hopped out of the car at that point and ran straight towards the guy. I immediately knew that I was fucked. I got out and gave them commands to back up and get on the ground. Neither of them complied, obviously. He then proceeded to charge at me, and he knocked me to the ground in one swoop. Luckily I was able to get him on his back and get up. I saw my date grab a metal pipe from the van. She told me that they had a gun and to give them my money and truck and I wouldn't get hurt. Of course, with my I'm invincible mentality, I said no. She started to cry and say that they didn't want to hurt me. He then started to go back towards his van. At that point, I told them that I was a cop, drew my concealed firearm, and told them to lay on the ground. After a shared moment of shock, they complied. I was able to call 911, tell them my name and my badge number. I had two at gunpoint and needed backup immediately. I gave our dispatcher the best directions I could to this field. While on the phone though, they both fled. Again, stupid new cop young guy mindset. I chased them. I took off after the man who ran into the woods around the field. I chased him for maybe 30 seconds and heard three loud pops and saw the flash of a muzzle. My I'm invincible mentality went right out the window. I ran like hell back towards my car and peeled the hell out of there. I went back to the area that I picked her up in, called dispatch again, and had officers come to that location. Of course, the first officers to pull up were my sergeant and my field training officer. They were both completely understanding and didn't give me any sh** about it at all. The most used words were dumbass and stupid fucking rookie. I hopped in the car and went towards the field. Luckily the van was still there. I was told to shut my mouth and to only come out if they started to get shot at. They cleared the area and started looking in the van. They found meth right there on the center console and continued to search the car. What scared me the most was when my field training officer and sergeant came back to the patrol car. They let me out and told me to come look in the back of the van. Both of them were pale looking horrified. I went to the back of the van where there were several knives, duct tape, lighter fluid, a decent amount of rifle ammunition, handcuffs, and what looked to be dried blood. In the front passenger seat, we found an AR-15 style rifle and two more handguns. We called for immediate backup plus detectives. The license plates had been stolen. The van had also been reported stolen. 
The tests on that blood in the back of the van turned out to be positive for what we thought it was. I still get shit about this whole encounter, but luckily no one got hurt. And I can honestly say that I will never use online dating again. Ever. This story happened when I was growing up, around 2004 or 2005, when I was about 13 years old. It took place in a rural area, a good ways outside of the town of Uvalde, Texas. The town itself was really small back then, and not much to look at. It's just one of those towns that really isn't on the way to anything important. My father knew someone who owned a deer lease that was about a thousand acres and was complaining about a ton of hogs that were tearing up their land. Being open season on hogs in the south, my dad thought he would surprise me that summer and take me down for a week to go hunting for them. Not only did that help him with the networking for his job, but also gave us some quality father-son time. I remember the drive down there from Dallas was torture. It was about seven hours in my dad's hardtop Jeep Wrangler. The car was so uncomfortable that I hated it. All I had to do to pass the time was stare out the window or try to beat Super Mario Land on my Game Boy Pocket, something I was never able to accomplish anyway. The drive, obviously, took most of the day, so we got there in the early evening. The owner of the land had told my dad that he hadn't had anyone lease it that year yet, and the cabin on the property might be a little rough and dusty. I didn't really care. At this point in my life, I had been in scouts for a couple years, and spent a lot of my free time in the woods or fishing with friends. Needless to say, I was pretty comfortable roughing it. So after unlocking the gate and driving to the cabin on the land, we settled in. The cabin was pretty rough. Dust and dirt everywhere. Flies. I remember that it looked like some raccoons had gotten into the cabin and crapped on the floor. After cleaning up a little bit, we got the sleeping bags out and then set up the cots that we decided to sleep on. Something about that night was weird. I never was able to get comfortable enough to fall asleep for any restful amount of time. I couldn't put my finger on why, but I had that feeling of being watched. I was finally able to drift off for what I guessed was an hour maybe. When we woke up, it was early, about 6 a.m. We decided to scout around the land for tracks and signs of hogs and then find a good place to set up a blind. It was the summer and horribly hot in the afternoons, so morning was the best time to be out and about. After walking for an hour or so, we came to an area of trees, lightly dense, and luckily found some sign of hogs. Typical torn up ground where they had been rooting, so we followed them into the trees. I was looking for more signs when my dad stopped me with his arm. I remember looking up and seeing someone standing about 50 yards away. Some of their body was blocked by trees. This was private land, so they definitely weren't supposed to be there. We also had confirmation from the owner before we got to the lease that nobody was there. Not to mention that the gate was locked up when we first arrived. The person was wearing a brightly colored red jacket. We slowly walked towards them, and my dad called out something like, Hey, we're hunters. This is private land. And the person didn't move at all. Dead still. We were about 30 yards away and could see that he was turned away from us, with his hands in his pockets. Weird thing was that the person was in a ski jacket and what looked to be ski pants. Now this is Texas in the summer, it was about 98 degrees outside by then. My dad called out one more time, no reaction. He told me to stay behind him as he unsnapped the clip to his pistol holster. We approached the person's right side and then my dad told me to stay put, about 20 yards away. I crouched down, watched him circle around to the front of the man, all the while talking to him, asking if he was okay. He finally made it around to the front of the man, and my dad stood straight up with a confused look on his face. I called out and asked, what's wrong? He called back saying, it's a mannequin. I walked over to it while my dad stood there staring, and as I got closer, one thing stood out the most. The clothes it was wearing were brand new. No dust, sap, bird droppings, 
or any signs of being outside for more than a day or two. At that moment, I looked at my dad and could see him get worried. Almost immediately after, I felt that feeling again, like we were being watched, and I knew my dad felt it too. I wanted to start crying. I remember feeling so suddenly scared. My dad whispered, we're leaving right now. He grabbed my hand and drew his pistol. He scanned the area the whole way back while I was trying to hold back panicked tears. We got back as fast as we could. I was terrified so it felt like an eternity, but in reality it was probably only about 45 minutes. After returning, we packed up and beat feet. We drove back home that day and didn't talk too much on the way back. I remember right after we left, my dad called his buddy, the owner of the land, and he was confused as well. He said that he would go check it out next week when he was in the area. He also said that he had never had an issue with people because his property was high fenced. My dad normally isn't a paranoid person, but me being young and the least possibly having someone there that we didn't know about, he decided to be cautious and just get us out of there. After we got back home, we talked, and my dad wasn't able to sleep the night before as well. He had the same feeling, but didn't want to wake me up because he thought I was sleeping. Turns out, the next week he got a call from his buddy. He had checked the whole property and never found a trace of anyone. No mannequin, no anything. The story still makes my hair stand on end. No idea what that was, but the paranoid man in me thinks it was some kind of trap or something. Not quite the creepiest thing that has ever happened to me in the woods, but certainly top three. I'm also glad that whoever was out there, at the same time as me and my father, that we didn't have the pleasure of meeting. I could give you a million times as a kid and young adult that I felt scared or paranoid playing in the woods. It's a beautiful place, and I spent my entire childhood getting lost, not literally, out there by myself or with friends. As kids, we never got too far out there, but you could actually see the progression of us venturing further and further out as we got older, because of forts and carvings we would leave. This one particular time, my best friend and I had just graduated high school, and we decided to venture out, like we had a thousand times before. It was our last summer of freedom, and we spent the entire summer camping and hiking out there. We had decided to try and find a new place to set up camp and walked for what felt like a few miles before we came to a nice clearing. The area was relatively new to the both of us. We got the camp set up and fire going, and the plan was to wait until nightfall, smoke some weed, and play some Monopoly. For a little backstory on my friend and I, my buddy is a smaller, real goofy guy, but comes from a family of foresters and always had a deep understanding of all the trees and different plants he would come across. He had no fear of going and camping out by himself. If I spent 10,000 hours in the woods, he probably had spent 50,000. As for me, I'm a taller, sturdier guy, and as we got older, I spent more time worried about women and sports. So the woods quickly became a place for small parties. Also, I never had the balls to camp out alone. In fact, older me wouldn't go far at all when I was alone because I could never shake the feeling of being watched, which was just paranoia, but it's still an uneasy feeling. Anyway, camp is set, fire is going, but it's getting lower and needs wood. Sun is down and we're both cutting up and having a good time. My friend is sitting on this little chair he always brought and loading up his makeshift bong. I was crouched breaking off some excess limbs from the logs that we had gathered for the fire. All of a sudden, this strong breeze cuts through the clearing. I couldn't tell you if it was the suddenness of it or what, but my friend and I both stopped immediately and looked at each other. The breeze went just long enough to flicker our fire down to a small flame. We both sat completely still, in almost total darkness, and neither of us said a word. Across from us, on the other side of the fire, we could hear footsteps. They sounded like somebody was running and would slow down to a walk 
and then run again, definitely on two legs. By the sound of it, they were pacing back and forth over the same spot. Then, just like it started, it stopped, with a softer crunch on the underbrush. I knew by sound that it had taken a crouch. I was crouched still, and knew I was staring right at it in the darkness. My friend grabbed my shoulder and said, Buddy? And when he did, I felt this surge of fear come over me. I could feel it and hear it in him. I had been so fixed on the footsteps and rationalizing what I heard that I hadn't even considered being afraid. But this was true fear. It was raw and made me feel helpless. I could hear my friend after a while grab some leaves and he dropped them on the fire. For a split second, the leaves covered the fire and we were in pure darkness. Then the fire sprang to life. We both quickly grabbed more brush and leaves and threw it on the fire. I got some sticks and logs on there and neither of us took our eyes off the spot or moved much for over an hour. Finally, the leaves crunched and whatever it was, slowly walked off. It had sat, crouched, watching us without moving for far longer than any animal would have. It wasn't until after the footsteps disappeared that I realized that there was a stench that had disappeared as well. It had smelled like a paper mill, spoiled eggs almost. For the rest of the night, besides whispered remarks, neither of us really moved or stopped looking at that spot. Nobody went into the tent, and I had a very short, light sleep sitting on the ground with my head rested on my hands. My friend never went to sleep. In the morning, we packed up silently and walked back home before day even broke. To this day, we talk about it. In the seven to eight years since it's happened, my forester friend has not camped by himself out there since. He's braver than I am, but I'm glad to follow his lead in this instance. I don't think I'll be heading back out to those woods anytime soon. These events occurred two summers ago in the Grand Teton area. My boyfriend at the time, now husband, let's call him H, was an avid outdoorsman and also served in the military. I was an ecology major and wanted to spend more time outdoors, so he decided to take me on my first backpack trip, just the two of us. For those who aren't familiar, the Grand Tetons are well known for their wildlife, specifically grizzly bears. My only experience with bears up to this point was watching a little black bear cross the road from the safety of my car. Seeing grizzly country signs around every corner wasn't doing much to calm my nerves. First incident. My boyfriend looked like Indiana Jones, machete hanging from his belt, large knives attached to each side of his pack, bear spray strapped to his waist. You get the picture. The beginning of our 25 mile journey was all uphill. When in bear country, you're supposed to make noise as to not startle the wildlife by accidentally sneaking up on it. As you can imagine, going up a steep hill while carrying a 40 pound pack makes it difficult to make conversation. We were an hour in, and almost at the top of the ascent, I noticed that the woods had gone completely silent, save for the rushing stream that was to our left of the trail. Silent woods are never a good sign. This usually indicates predators are nearby. At this point, I was in front of my boyfriend, and we were about to crest the hill. For the past 20 minutes, we had not said a word to each other, having been too tired to speak. We noticed the silence at the same time and gave each other knowing glances. I came up over the top of the hill and immediately froze. Sitting not ten feet in front of me, in the middle of the trail, was a grizzly bear. My husband wasn't aware yet, as he was behind me, so I did the first thing I could think of. While still in my frozen stance, I managed to take my arm and start flinging it wildly behind me, trying to get H's attention. I was too terrified to speak. The bear went from sitting to all fours, not looking away from us once. H quickly swung me around so that I was behind him, and he just started yelling. Being in the military, 
He knows how to yell. The grizzly wasn't quite phased though, as it started to walk slowly towards us. At this point, I was on the verge of passing out from terror. This bear was about five feet in front of us when we heard a loud crack coming from the woods to our right. The bear heard it too, and he bolted towards the stream. A second crack boomed again, this time much closer than before. H said, it's probably just some falling branches, but we both knew that wasn't the case. At this point, we were walking quickly up the trail in an attempt to create some distance from the grizzly and those strange noises. I felt the hairs on the back of my neck stand straight up, and at that same moment, H stopped moving in front of me. He turned around to look at me, and I turned to look behind me. To this day, we are not sure what we saw. Back where we were standing was a large, black, brown mass. It looked to be three times bigger than the already large grizzly we had just seen a few moments before. Its back was facing us, and then it stood on its back legs. It looked similar to a bear, but something about the shape was just off. At this point, it was probably stupid to run away, but that's exactly what we did. We were aware of heavy footsteps behind us, but neither of us looked back. The footsteps eventually faded. At this point, I was a mess. H was doing his best to console me. Honey, this is extremely unusual. The bears usually stay away from humans. We're going to be okay. I'm sure that won't happen again. That was enough to convince me to continue on the backpack. Not another hour later though, we reached a clearing where we decided to take a rest and eat a snack. About a minute after we had sat down, I noticed bushes moving in a line towards the clearing, towards us. Out of the brush comes this adolescent grizzly who looks just as spooked as I'm sure we did, but he came straight for us. H being the crazy nut that he is, decided to charge back at the bear while screaming, bear spray at the ready. That did the trick and the bear ran off. All I could think was, just my luck. But that wasn't even close to what happened the second night. Second night. Before we began our backpack, we had to let the ranger station know which trails and route we planned to take. With this information, they usually send a ranger on horseback at some point during the backpack to check on you to make sure that everything is okay. There were not many approved trails left for us to choose from, and it was just our luck that they were the most difficult. Apparently over the three days we were on those trails, we had been the sole hikers. We didn't see a single other person once we were en route. Anyhow, I guess we missed the ranger who came to check on us. We had been following hoof prints the entire second day, and we hadn't seen any the day before. I had some foot problems, so we spent valuable daylight trying to adjust my boot, laces, and socks to compensate for the pain. When we started on the trail again, we had maybe an hour or two left of daylight, and in the woods, it gets dark fast. I was exhausted. It was now dark out, and H was the only one with a working headlamp, as mine wouldn't even turn on for some reason. We needed to find somewhere to set up camp, as we still needed to eat. It was freezing, and the wind was blowing. It was creating a howling sound as it rushed through the trees, which made it difficult to hear H or discern any other sounds coming from the woods. After another hour of hiking through the dark, we found a clearing. Well, it was more like a bowl. It looked to be about 200 meters in diameter, with the sides being 10 meters down from the trail to the bottom of the clearing. This place was strange. We both felt it, though he didn't tell me how freaked he was till after we had left. There was no moonlight, so all we had was the illumination from his headlamp our small camp stove, and the flashlight that I fished from my pack. Half of the trees were either dead or fallen, just in the bowl. The vegetation everywhere else was very dense. To help alleviate my anxiousness, he started playing Ninja Sex Party out of his portable speaker. This didn't help much, as it just echoed off the trees, creating a dissonance of sound. He also thought that it would ward off any predators nearby. This is when we knew our anxiousness wasn't paranoia. The silence was back, 
There hadn't been a single bird chirp since we arrived at the clearing. It also may have had to do with the obnoxious music, but because of our previous experience, we decided to turn off the music and head into our tent. As soon as we were situated in our sleeping bags, we heard deep cracks and thuds echoing from beyond the tree line. Falling trees? There had been a lot of wildfires and very little rain this season. Thud. We both froze. That sound wasn't an echo. It came from inside the clearing. Definitely wasn't a falling tree. Thud. It came from right outside the tent this time. We both stopped breathing. H's hand found mine, and we clung to each other, paralyzed. Something dragged across the outside of our tent, making an indent as it went along. It was thin, almost like a finger. What is it? I whispered, shaking. I don't know. Shouldn't be a person. We're the only ones on this side of the mountain. I was trying my hardest to stifle sobs, trying to listen to what was outside. I could hear steps but couldn't decipher what it was. The step stopped, and then the whole side of the tent was slowly pushed inwards. At this point, whatever was outside knew we were inside, so I shined my flashlight at the side of the tent, and what I saw made my blood run cold. It was the shape of a human face pressed into the tent wall. I could make out the nose and an open mouth. Each time they breathed, it made the tent around their mouth billow in and out. H said, F*** that, and pulled a Glock from his sleeping bag. He cocked it, and the sound shattered the silence. The face pulled back, and we heard fast footsteps heading towards the edge of the clearing. We didn't leave the tent till the sun was shining the next morning. The first thing we noticed was the smell of urine. We came out of the tent and looked around. Whoever it was, had peed on our coals we had left in the fire, leaving a disgusting stench of evaporated urine. Footprints surrounded our tent, circling it multiple times. Muddy handprints decorated the outside of our tent as well. We think it was mud anyway. The takeaway from all of this? Wildlife is far from the most dangerous thing in the backcountry, and what was my first backpack trip will most likely be my last. So this only happened yesterday, and it's been driving me crazy ever since. It's not as wild as other stories here, but it's by far one of the creepiest things that's ever happened to me. So my husband and I are walking home from having a beer at the local pub around 6pm last night. In terms of setting the scene, we live in a small New Zealand town, population of about 2,000. It's a real mixed bag in terms of residents. Older folks, meth heads, low income, but increasingly, Commuters from our capital city have been settling here. We happen to fall into the latter category. It's spring here, so it was still plenty of light out, and we're just chatting as we walk the 10 minutes or so home. About three minutes into the walk, at the first intersection, I spot a cat sitting on the fence of one of the corner houses on the other side of the street from us. I say meow, and it meows back. It then starts stalking a bird, so my husband and I continue watching this house. The cat, really, as we continue to walk past. Suddenly, a person with a brown paper mask on their head kind of stumbles out of the front door and into the yard. Their mannerisms and how they're moving are so strange, but not what I'd associate with being drunk. The house itself seems completely dead, so there's no party on or anything. The person then turns to us and makes eye contact. Well, the eye holes in the mask are staring at us at least, and they slowly start backing away to the front door alcove of the house and disappear from view. We've been slowly walking this whole time, and at this point, I have literal goosebumps and an intense sense of dread. When I write it down, it sounds so silly, but there was something just so very creepy about this person. We're still looking as we walk past the house, and the paper bag face slowly emerges from the alcove again, watching us before disappearing from view once more. As we walk and get further and further away, we keep turning around to look, and the same thing happens over and over again. 
Slowly but surely, the paper bag face emerges out to watch us. This continued until we were at the end of the street, about 300 feet, and rounded the corner to be out of sight ourselves. It still makes my skin crawl thinking about it. My husband laughed and said it was probably some kid getting ready for Halloween or just f***ing with us. And he's probably right, but I had to keep turning around to watch my back the rest of the walk home because I was just so creeped out. Why a paper bag mask? This happened when I was about 16 years old, so over 20 years ago now. I have five younger siblings, and my little sister would have been five years old at the time. We lived in a bad neighborhood, in the housing projects. Our neighbor was nice, but she always had sketchy looking people hanging around mostly men. One day, these two new guys started hanging out there every day. They'd always be outside smoking or just sitting on our porch. They made me really uncomfortable. They were always staring at me and would sometimes try to get me to walk over and talk to them. Or they'd come over into our yard when my parents weren't home and try to talk to me, asking me if I had a boyfriend and asking me if I wanted some beer or weed I was a goody two-shoes Mormon girl, so I was always like, no thank you, I have to go inside now. They were probably both around 30 years old or so. Then they started coming over and asking to use our phone when my parents weren't home. My parents always let the neighbors use our phone, so I never said no, but I would just pass it through the door and make them stay on the porch. They'd sometimes ask to come in or try to talk to me still, but I would tell them no because my parents weren't home. Now I realize just how dumb that was, because they could have just pushed the door open. But I was raised to ignore red flags and be polite and sweet at all times. Anyway, we had a little dog, and I always took him outside early in the morning on a leash. I was out one morning, and one of the guys came outside and stood there staring at me for a few moments before returning back inside. I brought the dog inside myself, and just a few minutes later, there's a quiet knock on the door. I opened it, and both guys are there. One says, We just saw your baby sister out by the highway. You need to come and get her. I panicked and ran outside with them almost instinctually. I started to run down our street towards the highway, and one of them says, No, we'll drive you there. We need to hurry. I seriously took two steps towards their truck before I realized what it was I was doing. I stopped and said that I needed to go back inside and tell my parents. The man closest to me grabbed me by my arm and jerked me towards the truck yelling, we have to go now, she's gonna get hit by a car. I instantly felt sick and just yelled, let go of me. He dropped my arm and I ran back inside my house. I ran into my parents' bedroom to wake them up and my little sister was sleeping in their bed with them. I woke everyone up because of how hard I was freaking out. My dad ran outside to find the guys, but they and their truck were gone. I never saw them at the neighbor's house again. I wish I could say that my parents called the police or something, but they just kind of shrugged it off and made excuses like, maybe they saw another kid that looked like your sister. That's some logic that I just could never get behind, and I truly believe that something terrible awaited me if they had gotten me into their truck. I'm glad that my senses returned to me when they did, although I'm still a little embarrassed about how willingly I almost became a key part in my own abduction. The following story is 100% true, and the dates listed are the estimated dates that this story roamed free for me. It was the only time in my entire life that I ever questioned my own sanity and or my own perceptions. I ask that you listen to this story in full, as this is one of those few cases where there is an actual ending to the story. I'm writing this today because I believe that this story is one we all can learn from. Location, a mid-sized city located roughly two and a half hours southwest of Chicago. The town sits right on the Mississippi River, bordering the state of Iowa. The focal point of our story was sited at a small park smack dab in the middle of town. The park is surrounded by roughly four to five acres of timber. Sometime 
roughly in 1993 or 1994, was the first time that I heard about the lady in the woods. I was in fifth grade, hanging out with some other boys on the grade school grounds. The story is your typical ghost story. At Mel Park, our local hangout just blocks away, a child went missing after the sighting of a ghost. More specifically, the ghost of a woman dressed all in white. They didn't know the name of the child, but claimed that it happened in 1987. Another boy chimed in. There was also an adult who went missing, the night after a sighting of this same ghost a few years later. In both cases, the sightings happened after the park had closed, well after midnight. The park is nestled in between neighborhoods, and there have been reports of people who have moved out of their homes after seeing the woman drift through the woods. There were other stories I heard in the years after that included witchcraft, Satan worshipping, kidnapping, murder, and the occult. The story gained more momentum when another boy in our class found a pentagram spray-painted on a tree on a path near the park. We actually rode our bikes out to see it, and it was definitely there, crudely painted in what looked like a real hurry. It was one of those things where there was no real way to know if the pentagram was a part of the story or was put there because of the story. When you're in fifth grade, you rarely stop to think these things through. You only see what's in front of you, and what I was seeing was definitely creepy. May of 1995. A friend of ours named Michael lived only a block away from Mel Park. His parents decided to allow him to have a sleepover for his birthday party. He invited ten of us boys to stay the night, just doing what boys do. God bless those parents, by the way. That night, you can imagine where things headed. Michael knew all the Mel Park ghost stories. He lived the closest of all of us and had a neighbor who gave him all kinds of crazy information, or so he claimed. He rehashed a lot of the stories we had already heard, and even added a few others. After some time, and as the clock made its way near 1 a.m., it finally happened. One of the boys suggested that we sneak out, see if we could find this lady ghost. So that's exactly what we did. We all made it outside quietly enough, and made our way down the street, towards Mel Park. Once we made it to the park, we broke up into groups. A few walked onto the overgrown Little League baseball field. A few headed towards the playground equipment. Myself and another stayed in the parking lot nearest to Michael's house. Yeah, we were the skittish ones. I wish I could give you all kinds of cool things we did, but in real life, it's not that cool. Essentially, we kind of just walked around, looking and waiting. Really, we had only been there for maybe 15 to 20 minutes when it happened. I kid you not, just like the story, within minutes of us showing up, it was like a Lifetime movie. There she was. In the woods, I see what looks like a pale white woman. White hair, white flowing clothes, white pants. In the night, she looked like she was glowing. It was literally the perfect example of what you would think of as a ghost. I've never been so scared in my entire life. To this day, it's still the most terrifying moment I've ever been in, and that includes an automobile accident. Everyone saw her, all ten of us. She stuck out like a sore thumb, and we jetted. I mean, we ran faster than any of us had ever ran before, all of us completely silent, moving at our fastest rate towards Michael's home, and safety. I could embellish here and tell you that she chased us or made a move towards us. I could make it out like her head split in half and bees came flying out, but none of that happened. I don't believe the ghost lady even knew we were there. She looked as if she was simply peering deeper into the woods, as opposed to staring out at us frightened little boys running away terrified. That was that. We all made it back safely. We spent the rest of the night worried this lady ghost is going to show up and kidnap us. But she never showed. We return to school, and the Lady of the Woods becomes legend. All of us share the story. All of us back each other up. We even told one of our teachers. She politely listened, and then changed the subject. It was the coolest, 
most terrifying thing that ever happened to us. We had one of the best campfire ghost stories in history. And it was true. So time passes, like it always does. We move on from grade school to junior high, then to graduating high school. Once we got a little older, this story took a backseat to girls and just living life. I wouldn't say the story died. I know we spoke of it in passing. I know the story continued on in the grade school, at least for a short time after we left. One of the ten boys from the birthday party took his life shortly after high school, and it took everything in me not to blame this ghost story on that situation. We all move on to college. I lose touch with all but one of the ten, though a few I have on Facebook. 2010. After coming home from college and struggling to find my way in life, I finally start to get my act together. I find a full-time job, married my wife, got a dog, and even had a couple of kids. Eventually, we purchased our first home, which just so happens to be blocks from my childhood house. I end up in a little tiny house, two streets over from Mel Park. After those floating years, I end up back where it all started. On my days off, I walk my dog in the very park where the Lady of the Woods scared me almost to death. This is where you really start to question yourself and your senses. At 27 years old, I would stare at the location where I saw that lady glowing all those years prior and try to make sense of it all. Now older and wiser, you spend a lot more time trying to feel things out rather than just reacting. How in the world did I see a ghost in the fifth grade with nine other people who saw the same thing? I know it wasn't a dream. I know it wasn't imagination. She was really there. What I saw was real but your brain has a funny way of making things fuzzy. It's hard to explain, but you start to question everything. You know it's real, but you know it's not. That sentence shouldn't be, but that's just how my mind would read the situation. It really was something that I wrestled with a bit, just trying to figure it all out. Summer of 2012. There I am, on another walk with my dog, coming up alongside the timber where I saw the lady in the woods all those years ago. I find myself thinking of her again. I'm thinking of my childhood friends. I'm wondering if they ever think of that moment like I do. The thought passes as I move along the path that leads me out of the park. In front of me, a large trailer hooked up to a pickup sits in the driveway nearest the park's wooded area. There's a middle-aged man moving some things onto the trailer as I approach. He sees me and says hello. I say hello back and then decided to make small talk with him. I ask him if he's moving. The man responds that he's just recently sold the home. It was his parents' house, and it had sold to a young couple. Closing was coming up shortly. I mention a few other things, and then start to head off. But I stop. Because that ghost story was on my mind, I decided to ask that man I didn't know if he knew the story himself. Why I did this is beyond me. It's definitely not something I would normally bring up in conversation. But this house was the closest one to the sighting, and I just needed confirmation that somebody else out there still knew the story. I don't remember exactly what I said, but I basically asked him if he had ever heard the ghost stories. I'll never, in my remaining years, forget what happened next. The man looks at me and smiles. He tells me he's heard those stories plenty. I'm actually relieved that he had, because I didn't actually think through how the conversation would go if he had no clue what I was talking about. I then proceed to give him the shortened version of the story you just heard. He listened, and I could tell that he was interested. When finished, he takes a moment, and he responds. I used to live in this house before the park was built. My parents raised me here. I moved out in 83 or 84. I think the park was built somewhere between 84 and 86, and my parents had been here ever since. My dad passed away in 91, and it was just my mom after that. That ghost you saw? That was my mom. I looked at him completely confused, but he continues. My mom had some medical issues that started in the mid-80s and continued all the way up until she passed away this last spring. The medicine they had her on 
will cause her to sleepwalk. I can't even count the amount of times I received calls in the middle of the night from the police department advising me that they had found my mother wandering in the park. I was told recently one of the neighbors moved out because they were tired of all the commotion. My sister lives in Texas. I could never get it through her thick skull that our mom needed to be moved to assisted living, so this went on for years. I found out from some friends that she had become a ghost story to the park. You see, my mom had a favorite robe that was all white and always slept in the same pearl silk pajamas. Everything was white. She even had white gloves she would put on from time to time. I can only imagine what that would look like in the middle of the night. That lamp over there by the playground would light her up like a Christmas tree, so it was never hard for police to locate her. So you see, that ghost you saw? That was just my mom sleepwalking. I bet I even got a call that night. I'm speechless. The lady in the woods was real, and she wasn't a ghost. She wasn't a dream. She was simply a woman. She was this man's mother, lonely and suffering from some medical condition that had her wandering the woods in the middle of the night. I only wish I knew more. I never saw that man again. The new couple moved in, probably oblivious to the ghost story its previous occupant had created. So I wonder, does her legend live on? Is there some fifth grader right now hearing the story? for the first time, of the lady in the woods, how she appears and kidnaps children, how there's a witch who murders those who see her in the middle of the night. 2021. I've moved from that tiny house to a bigger house in a new city. I no longer visit Mel Park. I never did learn that lady's name, and I always kick myself for not asking that man more questions. The thing that I find so interesting is how a story can become what it is. How one event can impact individuals like it did me. I still think of that lady all the time. When a story rolls out that seems impossible, the lady in the woods comes to my mind. Sometimes, the story is real, but the context is muddled. This single event impacted my approach to everything. I listen, I take in all of the story I can. If it seems impossible, I hold my tongue. Maybe it is impossible. Or maybe it's just being interpreted wrong. Last year, I was going out for drinks with my friends. But since I had class the next day, I only stayed till around midnight. My boyfriend promised to pick me up and go home with me because I don't like to take the subway alone at night. But since I was pretty drunk by then, I took a little too long walking out of the pub. Unfortunately, we had to wait for the night bus, with multiple stops, since the subway closes at a certain time on weeknights. For context, my boyfriend and I don't live together, but very close to each other. About a 10 minute walk. Both areas are pretty terrible. He lives near a train station, many drug addicts, homeless, and sketchy people around. And I live in a cheap, rough neighborhood with a high crime rate. My building has two entrances on two different streets because it's on the corner. I usually use the entrance door that is nearer to the subway and on the side that my apartment is on. We had to take two buses to go home. One drove us to the train station and the next one from the train station to my apartment. After getting out of the first bus, we realized that we would have to wait for about 20 minutes for the second bus to come. And since I really had to sleep at home, class the next day, I didn't want to stay at his place. My boyfriend didn't want to wait, so he persuaded me to walk instead of taking the bus, which sober me would have never done. But since I was still drunk, I didn't care how we got home, so I agreed. We started to walk home and passed a few sketchy people mostly people selling drugs, but nothing really bad. Then I saw a guy walking in our direction, and I got a bad feeling right about then. So I told my boyfriend that I wanted to change to the other side of the street because I didn't want to walk past him. Suddenly, the guy yelled, Hey! as if he wanted to ask us something, but we ignored it and continued to walk. He got louder and louder until he started to yell. 
I could see from the corner of my eye that he was coming over. So I whispered, run, to my boyfriend. I took his hand and ran the fastest that I could while he was chasing after us. We ran and ran and ran and made a turn to the right, which happened to be the street that I lived on, and hid. It seemed like he was gone, so I took my keys out and we started running towards my building, taking the other entrance of the building that I normally didn't use. As I was trying to open the door, my boyfriend started panicking, throwing me inside the patio and closing the door aggressively, and then pushing me further into the building. He explained that the guy came running from the other side of the street, meaning he took a shortcut, probably thinking we were going to run to the subway or the bus stop. If we had taken the other entrance, he would have been clearly the faster one. Being in shock, we unfortunately didn't call the police, which I now regret. I stopped going out for drinks and clubbing for about six months after this happened and slept at my boyfriend's place for two weeks straight because I was scared that that man would come back. I think the worst thing about this is that he really wanted to get us for some reason, whatever that may have been. I still want to know why he chased us for so long. Two weeks later, a girl about my age was assaulted a few streets away in front of her building by a man that had chased her home. I wonder, was it the same guy or just a coincidence? I'm usually a lurker here, but this memory from a year ago popped into my head and I want to share because I was so shocked in the moment. I realize now just how scary the situation was, and it was just all very strange. Keep in mind, this story is hard to describe, but I'll try my best. I was 22 at the time, and I met my dad at a tire shop in a really bad area downtown. Not really sure why we went to the shop. It was probably around noon. My dad had brought his chihuahua with him, so I took her on a walk around the tire shop while he consulted with the mechanics. The shop was about half a football field away from a busy street, with a big field in between the shop and the street, in an otherwise semi-residential area. I figured it was safe enough to walk the dog around in the field, because my dad and the mechanics were right there. However, the shop was fenced in and not facing the field. So I guess it wasn't actually that safe for me because my dad and the employees couldn't see me at all. So I was just walking the little dog around this field, not too close to the busy street. When suddenly, this beat up car with the windows down starts driving by really slowly on the busy street. I can tell the guy driving was staring at me. The street is somewhat far away from me and he eventually drives past. So I'm just like, whatever. But then a couple of seconds later, I see the car again, going down the street in the opposite direction, this time really fast. He turns onto the side street where I am. He's driving fast, and then he guns it into the field where I'm walking the dog, literally jumping the curb. He's coming straight for me, and I'm stuck in shock thinking, is he about to plow us down? What is happening? It was so quick and unexpected. In my confused shock, I'm hesitating with the dog, contemplating running away, but also not wanting to turn my back to the car. Then, by some miracle, the car comes to a jolting stop when it becomes lodged in a hole or some uneven patch of ground. The tires are still spinning as he continues to try and gun it. With his windows down, I can hear him cursing, and I take this moment to scoop up the dog and run out of there. He then opens the car door, about to get out. I can't remember any descriptions about this man, other than he was quite overweight. Again, because of the shock, I can't even recall his race or age or anything like that. At that moment, a truck pulls up beside us, with two youngish men inside. It was like a construction truck or something. They roll down the window and ask if this guy is bothering me. They say it loudly, and it spooks the guy as he gets back into his car. 
He's then able to peel out in reverse from whatever hole the car was stuck in. He very quickly smashes from the field, back onto the street, and takes off. The kind men who stopped apparently saw all of this happen, and they were just as confused as I was. What was this guy's game plan? What was he attempting? To kidnap me in broad daylight? With people around? I'm not sure. I'm so glad that his car got stuck, and I didn't have to find out. It was all just very strange. I can be overconfident at times about my safety, but after this, I've learned to always be alert. Bad things can happen anytime and anywhere, so don't freeze in between fight or flight. So many times I've frozen instead of fighting or flighting, when I really should have taken some kind of action. Not sure if in this situation, my guardian angels were winged spirits, or if they were two young men in a construction truck. Either way, I'm thankful for them. I'm a 17-year-old guy, currently living in Phoenix, Arizona. This incident took place around six months ago on an overnight trip into the Superstition Mountains, which are about an hour drive east of Phoenix. I'm not going to specify the exact trail, because I've been doing this stuff long enough to realize what happens when you post stuff on the internet. Whether it's a good trail, abandoned mine, ghosts, or whatever it may be, people come flocking, and usually with a lot of trash and loud music. Anyway, this particular trail I was taking was an eight mile loop through a canyon. Pretty simple in and out overnight trip. I had planned to go with my friend, but a last minute cancel on his part left me on my own. So with a packed bag and car ready to go, I decided to go out on my own. Not leaving the house on time and some trouble navigating rough forest roads, I didn't arrive to the trailhead until around 5.45 p.m., which for those of you who don't backpack, this is a very big no-no. I had about a four-mile hike until I arrived at my planned camping spot, and it was getting dark fast, so I figured if I moved quick enough, I could get at least two to three miles in before I had to find a spot. This strategy left me hiking a very dark trail on my own, with about 15 miles of dirt road between me and anyone else. Hiking in the dark by itself is scary, especially for where I was and being on my own. Eventually it got so dark that I could only see where my headlamp was pointing, and that's when I figured I needed to stop and get a camp set up. With only using the headlamp as my light source and trying to move fast, I ended up in a less than ideal spot but there were some burnt pieces of wood and the remains of a fire circle, so it looked like people had been there before, but definitely not recently. My first priority was to get a fire going. I scanned the area around me and was able to find some dry wood and I got the fire up and running. I got my tarp set up and cracked open a can of Chili Mac I had brought for myself and was very much looking forward to eating. I was feeling good. My camp was set up and my food was on the fire. The feeling of uneasiness from the hike in had almost gone away completely, but there was a smidge still there. Side effect of camping alone in remote areas, I suppose. To fully understand what happened, I have to explain to you how my camp was set up. The site I had picked was a small clearing surrounded by large pine trees with a trail about 30 feet to my left. When you're in the woods and have a fire going, the fire casts a circle of light around it and everything on the edge of that circle and past it are pitch black. I was sitting on the ground near my fire, eating my dinner, when a small rock about the size of a marble was thrown into my camp. I looked at the tiny rock in shock, as I was positive that I was the only person on this trail that night. I immediately turned my light on and towards the area where I had seen the rock come from, but due to the density of the pines and brush, I could only see about 10 feet. I spent the next 15 minutes in disbelief as I scanned the tree line that surrounded me, searching for what or who had thrown the rock. Not daring to stray too far from my fire that in hindsight offered me a false sense of security. After sitting back down and spending the rest of my time on high alert, I was able to convince myself that I had somehow kicked the rock or that it had fallen from a tree. I went to sleep that night not expecting the pure terror that was about to unfold. I woke to the sound of rustling leaves 
barely audible if you weren't listening for them. But they were there. Still in a sleepy daze, I listened as the rustling leaves got harder to hear, as I assumed they were moving away from me. I went to grab my handheld flashlight that I had left next to me when I had fallen asleep. But the more I looked, the more scared I got as I came to realize that it was no longer there. I stood up in my sleeping bag and ducked out of my tarp to look around. I was able to see a light off in the woods. It couldn't have been more than 15 feet away. It was my flashlight, laying on the ground in a pile of leaves. This is one of the few moments in my life where I've almost shit my pants. The flashlight that I had left sitting right next to me when I had fallen asleep a few hours ago was now 15 feet away from me, past the tree line in the woods. I hurriedly slipped my boots on, clutching my knife in the other hand, and keeping my head on a swivel. I weighed my options. Stay here and wait out the night, or attempt the three-mile hike back to the car in the dark. I figured that whatever, or whoever was out there with me, was definitely going to have a better advantage if I was out on the trail without a light. So I decided to stay at the camp and wait the night out there. Eventually, it came back. I could hear the rustling through the woods, the sound of walking. It was far off, but I could hear it. It sounded like someone leisurely walking by, like they were on a stroll without a care in the world. Sometimes it would walk too far away and I would lose the sound of its steps. But then, an hour later, or maybe two, it would return, still just as faint as ever. This went on for about three or four hours until I listened to the steps get closer and closer until they were about seven feet from me. At this point, the fire had gotten very small as I had run out of wood in my pile. The footsteps stopped and everything went totally silent. I sat there still for two hours, clutching a knife in my hand and prayed that I wouldn't hear anything else. I stayed in that position until the sun cast enough light that I could see that I was alone in my campsite. I packed my things and speed walked the three miles back down the trail that I had taken. I arrived at the empty dirt road where my car was parked and nearly sprinted to it as I unlocked my Subaru. I jumped in, drove, and didn't stop until I had put at least 20 miles between me and that place. I stopped at a gas station in Apache Junction to buy a Red Bull, but mostly just to see and or talk to another person. As I exited the store, I was able to see that there was something on my back window. A message, scrawled in the dust. It read, Sleep well? A lot of weird things have happened to me on my various adventures through Arizona but this is by far the weirdest and scariest so far. So I thought I'd share it. There is a seriously deranged person living in the Superstition Mountains. Do yourself a favor and stay as far away from those mountains as you can. This story happened to me a couple of months back and I'm still not quite sure what to make of it. My housemates and I are all college students and young women. One night they decide to go on a night out while I decided to stay in and watch a movie with my boyfriend. At about midnight, someone knocked on the door. I answered it assuming it was one of my housemates, but it was this young guy who must have been around 18 to 20 years old. I asked him if he was okay and he told me that he'd lost one of his AirPods behind my house in the garden. He asked if I would help him look for it. The student house had a backyard with a very high brick wall. There wasn't even a walkway behind the back of the houses. Just a little path to a shop's garage and a couple of garden gates down. I immediately had an awful feeling about him. He didn't look threatening at all and was about my height, but it didn't feel right. He couldn't have been in my garden and on the off chance that he actually was, why was he back there anyway? It's not a walkway. There was no justifiable reason as to how he could have lost his AirPod there. I started questioning him, but not too harshly at that point. What do you mean you've lost your earphone? There's no way that you could have lost it in my backyard. How did you get access? Why were you back there? I don't understand. Whilst this was going on, 
I felt like he was trying to get into the house because he kept moving forward. My boyfriend eventually came out of the living room and the guy at the door kept asking us to help him look and specifically for me to get my housemates. My boyfriend was on the verge of helping him, but I'd half hidden myself behind the door and gave him a death stare. I did not want my boyfriend to help him, nor did I want this man in my house. My boyfriend ended up saying something along the lines of, hope you find your earphone, bud. Sorry about this, to the guy. To which the man aggressively responds, so you're not going to help me? My boyfriend flatly said, no, and shut the door in his face. And that was that. It really spooked me, and it left me with so many questions. I'm not very close with my housemates, but I had to let them all know what happened, and none of them knew this guy. I feel like I'm very intuitive, so I still believe something sinister or weird was going on, although I can't quite put my finger on it. Okay, so I'm a 19-year-old male, but this was back when I was 15. I had just recently finished hanging out with my then-girlfriend, so me and her were walking on a trail and hanging out. It was about 10 o'clock at night, and she had to get picked up, so we said our goodbyes, and she left. I didn't have a ride coming for me, so I had to make the trek home. It was about a 15-minute walk, and there was a road that I could have taken, but I was lazy, and there was a shortcut on a train track that ran through the woods. It cut the time of the walk down by about five or six minutes. So I started my short walk home, and all I could hear was silence, plus the occasional chirp of crickets. The beginning of my walk felt good. It was quiet and peaceful, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. I tried to shrug it off as nothing, but then I quickly remembered that this area of woods that I was cutting through is a known transient hangout spot, and this only helped to amplify my feelings of anxiety. Still, I trudged on having already walked too far to turn around, but that's when I see it, a silhouette in the tree line. I could tell that it was a man, although I couldn't see him properly, but I knew he wasn't out there for a midnight stroll in the woods. He calls out to me in a voice as raspy and deep as I can imagine. I was only 15, and I was pretty scrawny, so this deeply terrified me. I was already afraid of the dark, so this situation added to the fear I was already feeling. The hair stood up on my neck as the man started to run for me. I got chills coursing through my entire body, so I ran. I ran as fast as I could, but the side of the train track was all rocks, and it was at an incline, causing me to trip and cut up my knees and hands as I tried to scramble back to my feet. As I regained my footing, I never once looked back as I sprinted the entire way home. I got there, slammed the door behind me, ran upstairs to my bedroom, and pretty much threw myself onto the floor without as much as turning the lights on. I was exhausted, out of breath, and couldn't imagine running any further. I had a window that overlooked the path to where I exited the train tracks, so I gathered the courage that I had to look out the window. And there he was. I could see him standing behind a tree, glaring directly up at my window. I tried my best not to move the curtains or the blinds, but I know in my gut that he saw me the entire time. There's no way that I was going to sleep that night, so I didn't even try. Who knows what would have happened if he got to me. I never did see him again, Although, in all fairness, I hardly saw him that night. But believe me, I never walked down that track ever again. Forget that shortcut. Fifteen years ago, I made one of the worst decisions of my life. I began drug dealing for a well known biker gang. No, I wasn't a member but I had connections to one of their members through my mutual friend, Josh. I had a short history in dealing years before, but got clean and walked the straight and narrow. I worked three jobs and was saving for college. However, tragedy struck when a very close relative of mine was murdered by her new husband while they were traveling in his home country. 
What made this even more difficult is that they had canceled their life insurance, so the cost of returning them to our country and the funeral arrangements that followed fell onto me and two other close relatives. Now, this isn't an excuse for what I did. I just wanted to provide some context to what was going through my head when I met with Josh and asked to set up a meeting with his relative Mike, who was a member of the well-known biker gang, so that I could get back on my feet financially. If you're asking yourself why I didn't just pursue one of the millions of other avenues for financial assistance, it's because I was young, stupid, and wanted to replace that lost feeling with something I thought would make me feel better about myself at the time. So I gather a team of hand-picked dealers at my house and waited for Mike to come by to discuss business. And soon enough, he arrives with two pounds of weed to front to me. My plan was to only involve myself by distributing to my runners so that I could work my regular jobs while making a passive income. Side note, I had known Mike for about a year at this point, which is why so much was given up front. For those that don't know, the term front means to loan and the term runner refers to a dealer who works for you. Things went well over the next year and my team expanded. I was making a ton of money. I sold the weed to my runners by the ounce, paid a discount per the pound, and was making hundreds in profit a week, thousands a month. I was happy, Mike was happy, and he only ever had to deal with me and never had to meet or address any of my runners. However, this is where the story takes a drastic turn for the worse and why you should never trust a biker gang, especially when you're not working on the inside. I had just hired a good friend of mine as a runner. She needed money, was a single mother, and wanted to sell it to her friends who came over and always needed weed. This girl ended up selling through ounces faster than anyone else, so I trusted her with more product to sell at once, since I would have to come back two or three times a week. However, I was going on vacation for three weeks and wanted to make sure that she had access to enough while I was away, so I left her with a lot more than I usually would, which would turn out to not be a very bright move on my part. When I returned, I had come to collect and everybody but her was up to date on their payments. And after excuse, after excuse, she came to me to inform me that her new scale was set to the wrong measurement system and that she was out a good amount. I was upset and nearly kicked her off the team, but I've known this girl for years and it wasn't anything I couldn't recover on my own. However, she came to me when I was supposed to meet up with Mike to re-up, and because this took a lot longer than I had thought, I ended up being late to the meet. Now, remember when I said you should never trust a biker unless you operate on the inside? I met up with Mike to let him know what happened, apologized for being late, and informed him that the situation had been dealt with. But Mike was furious. He tells me that because I was late, he was late meeting his connect for the weed. And since he was late, this connect would never deal with him again. He told me to meet him at Josh's house and to bring who was responsible for making me late. And if I didn't bring them, then I would be held accountable because this connect had made him 5,000 a week in profit. Yeah, you heard right. This man told me that him being late once dissolved a profitable relationship with a connect that earned him 5K a week. I already knew what this meant for my runner. We were good friends and there's no way I was going to allow a single mother to go through what I knew was coming her way. So I showed up to Josh's house on my own and waited for Mike. I sat on Josh's couch for what felt like hours, by myself, and uncertain of the extent of what was going to happen. Then Mike walks in, greets Josh, talks with his partners for a bit, while completely ignoring me. First five minutes go by, then ten. Then Mike walks over and I remember waking up on the floor. From what I was told, Mike hit me across the head and I blacked out. He proceeded to hit me for two to three more minutes until I woke up to him still hitting me. We sat on the couch and with a handgun to my head, he tells me that he's going to charge me the profit he would have made every week from his connect for the next year. For those keeping track, that's $260,000. He tells me that he's going to be generous enough to do the first payment of 5000 within 48 hours. That the money that I just gave him for my re-up didn't count. That I needed to return the weed. 
and that he was giving me 24 hours for each additional 5k after that. He took my car, which he underpriced at $10,000. This was a newish Mercedes at the time that I was still making payments on, and he essentially planned on using me as a human ATM. At this point, I knew what was happening, and despite our relationship for the past year, he was going to exploit me for as long as he could until he had reason to get rid of me. So I went home, thought about my options. I had about 17000 in cash and another 18000 in savings, but even that would only get me by on the payments for a week. I realized that even if I was able to come up with half of the money, I would end up in jail or worse. After 24 hours of deliberating, I considered the fact that Mike had never met any of my runners. My family had moved away from this town after the death of my relative, and there was no way I was going to risk my life or my freedom for some arbitrary debt. So I took all my cash, made my savings available, and I knew I only had 24 hours to run as fast as I could and as far as I could. 4.30 a.m. I gathered a bag full of clothes, called a lifelong friend of mine who had moved to another country, explained the situation, and asked if I could stay on his couch for a week. I then took a bus as close to the Greyhound station as I could get without stopping in front of it. The Greyhound didn't require a photo ID at the time, and I didn't want to fly out of my own city in case anyone saw me, or Mike was able to figure out where I was going by pressing any of the airport staff. At this point, my heart was beating out of my chest, because although the Greyhound isn't as busy as the airport, if Mike or anyone he knew saw me there, it would be game over. I waited an hour, then walked inside, bought a ticket for a city three and a half hours away that had an airport. Before boarding, I wrote down all my important contacts, I removed the battery from my phone, dropped it down the sewer, and began my escape. 8.15 a.m., I stop in said city, buy an airplane ticket to go and meet said friend. 12.30 p.m., I land in a country that I've never been to, in a city that I've never even thought about. My friend picks me up and we talk about the situation the entire way home. He and I had similar pasts, and although the story itself is ridiculous, he understands. When we arrive at his place, I cut my hair, decide on a new name that I'll go by while staying in the city, while deciding on my next move. I get a new prepaid phone and a new phone number, and then I try to relax. 6 p.m. I was supposed to meet Mike 30 minutes ago, and the stress comes flooding in. 8 p.m. We've been drinking and telling stories, and I remember that I hadn't deleted my Facebook. So I jumped onto my friend's laptop, threw on a VPN that was located in my home country, and was met with a flood of messages. Josh and Mike had kicked in my front door and destroyed the place. They left messages with the addresses of places they thought I was hiding out. They told me that they were watching the airport and bus stations, and told me that it would be impossible to leave the city. It was at that point that I realized they never knew I left. Throughout the coming weeks, months, and years, I made a habit of changing phones and moved around from city to city and country to country. I even did those work-for-your-accommodation programs in a couple of the countries as a tourist. Every few weeks and months, I would get an email from a single friend back home who would tell me that Josh or his girlfriend were telling people to assure me that it was okay to come back and that things had blown over. A couple of times, I even tried to reach out to some other friends back home, only to find out that they were trying to cash in on the reward Mike had placed to anyone who could find out where I was. It eventually became easier to cut contact with anyone and everyone around me if I felt that I needed to move on or felt that I couldn't trust them entirely. I could never go back to who I was or where I came from physically or mentally. I later found out that Mike had a nasty habit of hiring dealers. Then when he thought they had made a good amount of money, he would conjure up some dire situation in which they needed to pay him back a crazy amount of money. He would drain them for every dime they had until they couldn't pay anymore. After that, they would usually end up in a ditch somewhere. One of his associates, who happened to be my next door neighbor back home, was recently charged for first degree murder after taking a woman out to the woods and disposing of her. Although this did a number on my trust issues, 
I've made a lot of changes throughout my life since the event. I've changed my name. I'm in my mid-30s now. I have an amazing corporate position in a company that changes lives. I speak to schools about the impact of poverty, and it's taught me to empathize with people in different situations than my own. I own a condo in a beautiful city. I'm engaged, took up learning a second language, and I never take the second chance that I've been given for granted. I've been clean for just over 15 years now. I've never told anyone in my new life about what's happened. I don't think they would believe me if I did. Even though I take full responsibility for my stupidity in my younger years, to the biker that is waiting to collect on his ridiculous $260,000 debt, I only hope that we never meet again. This happened last night around 7.30 p.m., so it was already dark outside. My friend and I, both 22-year-old females, were about two-thirds of the way through our 16-hour drive back home from Salem, Massachusetts. I really needed a pee, so we stopped at a rest area in eastern Pennsylvania. I usually avoid rest areas, but it looked nice enough, and I didn't have any bad feelings about it. We walked in, and the only other person inside was an older man probably mid to late 60s, standing by the vending machines, talking on his phone. We went past him, across the room, and into the bathroom. We were in there for a good 10 to 15 minutes because my friend had some acne that needed some attention. When we were finished, we walked back out laughing at something one of us had said, and the man was still standing there, but he was no longer on the phone. He stared and smiled at us, in what we both thought was a creepy manner. His gaze followed us the entire time it took us to get to the door to exit the rest area. We started running back to my car, which was about six parking spaces from the door. Still laughing, but also a little freaked out. We were about to get in the car when I remembered my boyfriend wanted us to check my oil on the way home since it was such a long drive and my car had been having some slight issues. I considered waiting until the next time we needed a stop for gas, but decided to just get it over with. As I was checking the oil, the man from before, along with another slightly younger man that we hadn't seen, left the rest area. They both started walking towards us, with the younger one coming ahead on the sidewalk and the older one kind of going diagonally towards the driver's side of the car. This was odd because there were no other cars past mine. The only cars I could see were on the other side of the lot, closer to the building. My friend and I looked at each other and bolted for the car doors, but then I realized I was still holding the dipstick, so I cursed and we had to run back over to lift the hood up. We hurried into the car and locked the doors just as they were approaching. We watched as the younger man walked slowly past the car, staring in at us with a blank face. He continued walking down the sidewalk for a while before pausing and turning around to come back towards us. The older man, still smiling, mind you, got within a few feet of the driver's side door, then turned and walked past us to the other side of the parking lot. I backed out, and once I straightened the car and started pulling forward to leave the rest area, we saw he had moved to the middle of the road and was standing there with that same unnerving smile but now he was motioning for us to stop. I drove past him because, uh, no way. We watched in the mirrors as both men got into cars on the other side of the parking lot closer to the building. We spent the next couple of hours shaken up and blabbing about what could have happened. I'm not sure what their intentions were, but there can't be any good reason to approach two women like that at a rest area. I tried telling myself that maybe they were gonna ask if I needed help with my car but I was very clearly just checking the oil. And it doesn't make sense why the younger man would walk the complete opposite direction from his car, go so far down the sidewalk, just to turn around and walk back towards us. So truth be told, I'm still not sure what their ideas were. And if I'm being honest with myself, I'm totally fine with it. My college was very safe. The worst that happened was crazy drunk frat boys getting the police called for mischief. It was your typical campus fitted with those blue boxes where you can call for an emergency. 
Now, when I walked around campus, I'd often scroll through Reddit or Instagram. I know it was stupid, but don't judge me. I was a college student. Anyway, this particular night it was dark out, but only about 7 p.m. There were lots of other students walking around, and the campus was pretty well lit. Yet for some reason, I didn't go on my phone this time. I just had this feeling that something was off. I couldn't place it, but in the back of my head, I felt like something bad was going to happen. The walk continued normally, and by the time I got back to my dorm, I had begun to laugh at myself. Now these were apartment-style dorms you entered from the outside via a pathway. As I got near my residence, the feeling from before returned, and this time I was hit by a sudden feeling of intense fear, much stronger than before. I looked around the common area and noticed a light coming from my room. Something told me not to investigate, and instead, I muttered, Seriously? I forgot it? And went back outside. I felt a bit paranoid for the next few minutes, crouching down behind the window like a crazy person. I began to think I was just being weird when I heard footsteps. I slowly peeked into the window to see a man I didn't know coming out of my room and pouring himself a glass of soda. He brought it back with him and disappeared into my room once more. I stayed there for what felt like forever until I'd guess about an hour passed and I heard footsteps again. He was headed for the front door and I bolted to the stairway. I climbed to the floor above and waited for a few minutes before returning. Sure enough, he was gone. And when I did enter my dorm, I no longer had a bad feeling. I checked the place thoroughly and found nothing to be out of the ordinary until I laid down to go to bed a few hours later and I felt something weird under the covers. I jolted up and turned on the lights to find a few condoms wrapped in plastic. I'm not sure what would have happened, but I'm fairly certain now that somebody was waiting to assault me. I didn't recognize this man from class, but he definitely was about my age. I don't know how he knew me, but the thought that I could have been stalked without realizing it struck me like a pound of bricks. I never saw the man again, and I never got the same feeling on campus. Somehow, I subconsciously knew that something was wrong. I have no clue how, and maybe there's an explanation. Maybe there's not at all. But that bad feeling may have saved my life. I hope and pray that nobody else finds themselves in a situation such as this. But if ever your gut tells you something, I implore you to take heed. It may make all the difference in the world. This is a story that my mother and aunts told me when I was in high school. I'm 21 now, but it has never left me. I think about it constantly and ponder over what could have happened. My grandfather passed two years ago, in June of 2020. He was 96 when he died, and it caused some issues in my family. They don't really pertain to the story, but there are some things about him that I have to share in order to explain the story in the best way possible. My grandfather, John, was a man who was extremely calloused and old-fashioned. He was bitter, abusive, and a complete macho man. My mother was raised on never showing emotion or pain due to his abuse and lack of compassion for others. He was also an extreme racist. He had many secrets in my family that are now coming to light after his death. Everything that happened around him was brushed off and forgotten because he had more important things to do, like drinking, and having affairs. Just an overall intense and very no-nonsense type of man. He was also far from religious and found things like faith and hope stupid. This story takes place sometime in the 70s, most likely early to mid-70s. My mom was born in 1965 and remembers this story clearly. My aunts as well remember this happening, but no one knows exactly what year. One summer day, John decided to take his family on a small outing with the intent to have a picnic in the woods. My mother, her three sisters, and her mother, my grandma, were all there and very excited about this. Where we are from, my family is more than accustomed to the woods and has lived in the area for generations. Going into the woods for fun family activity was nothing out of the ordinary, 
and seemed to be just another normal day. They made their way down a dirt backwoods road and stopped once they found a clearing large enough to accommodate them. As all the kids started jumping out of the car and messing around as kids do after being stuck in a ride together, my grandmother began unloading their food and picnic supplies. John began surveying the area and deciding just where to set up. As he was doing that, something in the woods past the clearing caught his eye. Before going to see what was out there, he yelled to the family and said that he would be right back. The kids and my grandmother thought nothing much of this. They were all used to the woods, and these woods in particular were very familiar to them. They continued unloading and setting up the stuff that they had brought. One of the girls pointed out something in the clearing that caused a sudden shift from a normal day to something far worse. It was a mound of dirt that looked like something was buried underneath it. This mound was about the size of a small person, maybe even child-sized. It was too big to simply be any animal in these woods. There was nothing but squirrels and raccoons in the area. Scattered amongst the mound were large river rocks. There was no pattern to them, but they were definitely placed on the mound intentionally. Also, the dirt seemed to be fresh, as though just buried. It was loose and slightly darker than the area around it. The mood immediately shifted from an average day in the woods to something much darker. My grandmother became concerned and told the girls to stay away from it. She was clearly upset and worried, but she did her best to ignore it. The girls, all being children, didn't have the same amount of worry and continued playing while just avoiding that mound. They tried to return to their picnic, and the girls were already chasing each other in circles again. It was supposed to be a joyous, sunny day, and my grandma wanted to keep it that way. Things seemed to return to normal for a beat. The trees around them created a wall of dense foliage, blocking their view from anything inside the forest. One of the girls again took notice to something strange. It was immediately clear what it was. Along one of the long branches of a tree hung a noose. It was tied with rope and hung high above their heads. A lump of dirt can be explained away by nature, but someone had to have placed the noose there intentionally. My grandmother stopped dead in her tracks when she first saw it. Something was wrong. Very, very wrong. They couldn't just pack up and leave. John was still out in the woods. Even children can recognize a noose as a symbol of death. The children started to become very anxious. Whatever innocence was keeping them from worrying about the mound had completely vanished at this point. My grandmother, being the resilient woman that she is, soothed her children and told them it was just left by deer hunters, but she knew in her heart that they needed to leave. No deer hunter would hang a deer and then bury it. At least, no sane deer hunter. It wasn't until they started hearing things in the woods that they began to really panic. My grandmother, as well as all the children, began hearing a rhythmic chanting from deep in the woods. It sounded as though there was a group of people all singing in deep voices to the beat of a drum. It went in a quick bum, bum, bum pattern. Three steady beats, followed by a pause, and then it would repeat. It sounded far away, but immediately fear began to take hold of each of them. They each listened and gathered together. As the seconds passed, it began to increase in volume. It wasn't just getting louder, but closer. What started out as a distant echo soon began to engulf the entire clearing. My grandmother was terrified and wanted so desperately to leave, but John had yet to return. They waited, fear-ridden as the sound began to fill their chests. It felt like they were at a concert as a deep bass began to vibrate their rib cages. It was everywhere and constant, as though the sound was being made by the trees themselves, surrounding the family in every direction. Suddenly, the sound of yelling broke through the constant drone of chanting. John's voice was yelling out to them from the trees. Go, he yelled, get in the car. He came running out of the woods, yelling that they needed to leave. They had never seen terror on this man as they had at this moment. He was a man afraid of nothing, unbothered by the world around him. This was the most emotion any of them had ever seen. He saw something in those woods, 
something that shook his very being to the core. John and my grandmother picked up their things and the children as quickly as possible and threw them all into the car. They had no care for the things they were packing up due to their fear. Food was all over the trunk. Items were broken. After everything was tossed in, they both got in the car, slammed their doors, and drove away. This is where the brunt of the story ends. But one fact from this story is what really has caused me to wonder all these years. My grandfather has refused to ever speak of what he saw. He never told any of the children or my grandma. Every time this story was brought up, he quickly rebuffed it and angrily told them not to ask again. He never went to the police or told someone outside of my family. My grandfather is the only person who knows what happened that day. When I first heard the story, I swore to myself that I would ask him one day what happened. Now I can't, and I regret it greatly. By the time I was in high school, he had moved out of the state with other family members, and I mostly lost contact with him outside of the occasional happy birthday call or letter. This story doesn't have an answer to go with it. When he died, the only thing I was sad about was never knowing what actually happened that day. We weren't close, and when I learned of all the abuse he caused, I separated myself from him pretty much entirely. His death looms over me, and the story still haunts me to this day. My mother and aunts just look back on it as a spooky memory from their childhood, nothing more than a story to scare little ones at Thanksgiving with. I am one of the only people in the family who is still curious about what happened. I've always been interested in mysteries, the occult, horror, and conspiracy theories. This story piqued my interest more than any others in my family. It just sucks that the possibility of knowing what happened passed with my grandfather a few years back. And though I'll spend a lot of my days wondering, I'll never know for fact what happened. This all happened to me this past Friday night. I'm a 30-year-old woman, and I work at a bar on weekends, about a mile away from my house. In nice weather, I like to walk the commute. It's a quiet residential area. The halfway point between my house and work is a park with a basketball court and an adjacent baseball field. I usually don't walk both to and from work in the same day. I'll take an Uber at least one way, and the times and days that I walk home vary as well just for context. I left work this night around 12.30 a.m. When about two blocks away from my job, I heard someone walking behind me. At first, I thought it was one of the guys that I work with. We've crossed paths on the walk home before, since we're somewhat neighbors. Nope, it's a young guy, maybe my age at the oldest. He's on the other side of the street, about a block behind me. He starts singing. At first I think, Okay, no big deal. Maybe he wants to make sure he doesn't sneak up on me. But the singing gets kind of eerie. It was starting to make the hair on the back of my neck rise. I start to pay attention and try to hear clues of mental instability or any direct communication to me. I'm about a block from the sports fields when he's getting closer, maybe 30 or 40 feet. I realize the houses past the fields are kind of unkempt, I've never seen anyone outside, even during the day, aka no one to help me if I needed it. I decide it's getting too creepy and abruptly turn around to start walking the way that I came from. He keeps walking his same direction, but I don't look back more than once to confirm his direction. I wait on a corner for two to three minutes, debating if I should call an Uber, return to the bar, or just keep walking. I've already texted a coworker who is still at the bar that I'm being followed, sketched out, and to be worried if I don't send a text upon my arrival home. Like any good horror movie, I stubbornly decide to keep walking home along my original route. The Uber is seven minutes away, ten dollars for a half mile trip, plus I'd be a sitting duck waiting for it. I don't want to walk the half mile back to the bar when my house is the same distance. I'm ultimately and finally swayed by the fact that I'd had a rough shift and the walk always seems to unwind me. It was a dumb choice, clearly the wrong one, but that's how I got to it. As I soldier on, I turn onto the street with the basketball court and fields. In the parking lot, there's a tiny compact car, the kind referred to as a clown car. 
It begins to pull out of the lot, but another car is approaching, so it's waiting directly in my path. I slow down. My gut is saying, don't get too close. Eventually, it pulled out in the direction that I was going, but it goes straight instead of turning where I'll be heading. I let out an audible sigh of relief. I notice a sharp smell as I pass the parking lot, almost like dry leaves, earthy but unidentifiable. I chalk it up to my subconscious being on high alert. I turn onto the upcoming street, which is the final stretch of dark residential area before I reach the almost home, safer leg of the trip. I trip over the curb, chide myself for looking vulnerable for even a moment, then pause to regain my composure. There's a U-Haul truck parked about a hundred feet ahead of me on the opposite side of the street. I look up and see two figures coming out from behind the truck. They are identical. All black outfits, weird black pilgrim-esque hats, and what I originally thought were clown masks. My first thought is, well, I'm f I think of the weird clown thing that happened a few years ago. After a moment, I realize the masks are all white, so either Michael Myers or hockey-style masks. This is somehow a relief, because clowns would have had me so terrified that I would have frozen. Something about the way they're moving is extra eerie. Outfits aside, my body is screaming, GTFO. Without speaking to each other, or me, they start walking diagonally across the street towards me. They never stop or turn to communicate with each other. I immediately do a 180 and start power walking. I'm already holding my phone as a precaution from the first singing guy, so I FaceTime my roommate, but she doesn't pick up. I call the cook that I thought the first guy was. He picks up on the second ring. I ask, where are you? I need help. I'm being followed. He's climbing in his car. He said he'll be there in two minutes. For some reason, we hang up. I'm now by the fields, and I realize they're again crossing a street to come in my direction. I call him back and tell him to stay on the line, because I'm not okay. It had to be obvious to them that I was terrified. The abrupt change of direction, phone calls, looking over my shoulder. I'm on high alert, yet also still doubting myself somehow. The park is a great place to smoke. It's almost Halloween, etc. I turn into the street where the singer was following me and pause. The house on the corner of the park is my number one pick if I end up having to bang on a door for help. They're always outside working on their cars, the property is well maintained, and their windows are within 10 feet of the sidewalk. It gives off good Samaritan vibes, a stark contrast to the surrounding houses that I've never seen anyone outside of. My friend pulls up to the corner within two minutes of my first call. A miracle. I run and hop in, tears starting to flow from the adrenaline release. We start driving back along the original path that I was on, and they're still there, standing in the basketball court's parking lot. Masks still on, not moving, not lighting anything, nothing but seemingly waiting for me. They watch us drive away. I get home locked my door, and did my best to calm down before going to bed. I obviously didn't sleep well. I call my dad the next day to share my story. He thought the first guy could have been a scout. The sharp smell could have been ether. He insists I talk to the police. I work again that night, still slightly traumatized, and I get a ride in. I can't bear to walk that path even in broad daylight. I stop at the police station after work and give them a play-by-play but only of the two masked creeps. The first singing guy seemed like a stretch to connect them, as the cops are looking at me slightly skeptical. The one asking me for details finally turns to the officer next to him and asks him to start his patrol at the park that night. They were polite, but unfazed. Didn't take my name or anything. The last creepy bit was finally heading home that night. It was exactly the same time as the previous evening, 12.30. A friend was giving me a ride, and we decided to take the same route and see if anything seems off. That same clown car was parked in the basketball court parking lot. Parked, but with their lights on. My friend suggests pulling over, half kidding, but I insist that we keep driving, already in a panic.
While I still haven't parsed through and made sense of everything that happened that night, it has changed my behavior. I simply won't walk home at night, and every time that I drive by that park, I'm always on high alert, looking for masks, creeps, and that clown car. For a little background, my parents, sister, and I live in an apartment complex for one more week. This apartment complex has been in the news recently for numerous health and property violations, and the new owner is being sued by an unlawfully evicted disabled person for stealing his motorized wheelchair. It's a mess, I know. There are mice, roaches, ants, and black mold in several of the units that the tenants are left to deal with on their own because the owners refuse to. There's gangs, shootings, break-ins, and vehicle damage. We pay almost $2,000 for a two-bedroom apartment, no washer or dryer. In the lease, it states 24-hour notice before maintenance are allowed to try to enter your house. We've had multiple problems with the maintenance team, as have others. They often wait until the women, kids, and teens are alone in the house to knock. Today I was trying to nap due to a severe double ear infection and strong antibiotics. The sounds of knocking and the doorbell woke me up. This was the conversation that I had. Hey, this is maintenance. We're cleaning the bathroom fans. Sorry, my parents, the leaseholders, they're not home, so no. Are you 18 or older? You look like it. Yeah? Okay, then we can come in. No, you can't. I close and lock the door, but sit in the living room just in case, because maintenance has keys. My mom came home minutes after, and I told her the situation. She's visibly upset, and said that she never got an email or letter, and she's not comfortable with them being in the house, so I did the right thing. She then has to go out to get something from the trunk of her car, gone for no more than five minutes. But thank God she locked the door behind her. Because no more than a few moments after she left, the door handle begins to jiggle. I creep over to it to look out the peephole, and I see this tall maintenance man. At least, that's what his uniform says, although I've never seen this man before. He attempts to open the door several times before turning around quietly and sauntering off back down the hallway. When my mom returned, she let me know that she went to the leasing office to tell them that the maintenance men can come and clean the bathroom fans once we're out of the apartment. The leasing agent looked rather confused and said that nobody on the maintenance team was doing rounds to clean bathroom fans right now. If that's indeed the case, then who is just at my front door? When I was around 24, I moved out to an apartment near my college since the dorms were unavailable and overall just not as spacious. However, I quickly realized that renting would be very expensive, especially for a college student. Thankfully, I was able to meet up with another student who wanted a buddy, and lucky me, he's a chef in the works and would love to cook every other night without me having to pay him. I would basically be his tester and read his cooking. Our first month together was the best. He made such exotic meals, they could only be found at high-end restaurants. Almost every cook night would be something I would look forward to. However, one Saturday morning, I woke up to some tummy ache. I had to rush to the bathroom and puked my guts out. I was actually surprised by this and went to my roommate who was making breakfast. He was surprised to hear this too and checked yesterday's leftovers, but didn't see anything bad. I figured it could have been that I simply ate too much since prior to dinner last night, I hit the gym and lifted a little heavier than usual. Every other night, in no partial pattern, I would experience more belly pain, kind of like both in and on my stomach. I assumed my habits of working out hard had to be the reason, coupled with eating a lot afterwards. But I also noticed that after eating, I would get so tired and usually go to bed right after, which never happened before moving in with my roommate. I also noticed that he always plated my food for me, and if I tried to help out or pour it myself, he would tell me that I would ruin his masterpiece. I can understand what he means, 
but it still made me a little suspicious. I finally decided to open up about this and talk to a close friend about it. She told me that she would stay with me for the night because I was suspicious that he was doing something to me, but couldn't for the life of me figure out if he really was. Now mind you, I know that I probably should move out and find another place to live, but I still had a few months on the lease and I didn't really have enough money to just up and leave. So that night, everything went as normal. I came home from the gym and had dinner with my roommate. But as I'm finishing up, my friend shows up and I pretend that I forgot to mention that my girlfriend, not really, just to make it believable, was sleeping over. Surprisingly, my roommate took this very well. It was about that time I started to get tired and I went to my room and soon fell asleep. So this is the perspective from my friend. She also went into my room and saw that I was fast asleep in quite a deep manner, but she knows very well that I'm a light sleeper. In fact, breathing hard enough could wake me up most nights. But she was patting and shaking me, and I just would not budge. Hours later, my friend woke up to the sound of the door opening. She stayed still, but from her original position, could see the door, and from adjusting to the darkness, she could see someone peeking in. At least five minutes passed by, and whoever it was, most likely my roommate, left and didn't come back the rest of the night. When I ultimately woke up, I didn't feel any sort of pain or discomfort, and my friend told me everything, including that she was worried that my roommate was the cause of my discomfort in the first place. So for a week, I decided to stay with her, and occasionally I would get texts from my roommate asking when I was coming back, including sending pictures of his delicious food. As much as I wanted to stay with my friend, I couldn't because she lived far from the college and it was a hassle trying to get to and from class. However, she did give me the idea of buying some secret spy cameras that look like regular things. So I bought two small wall clocks and two charger plugs. The layout of my room when looking from above is basically door on the upper left side of the room, TV and small table that it stands on, and the left center side of the room. Bed is on the right back corner of the room, and closet is at the front center. I set one clock to face the door, the other clock next to my closet facing me. I set one of the chargers in the wall opposite of where I slept, and then one in the plug right above where I slept. I thought that the positioning would be suspicious, but hopefully he wouldn't notice. Night came with the same routine. I went to bed that night and woke up around the same time I normally do with my belly aching. I then logged into my laptop and reviewed the footage. What I saw is what I expected, although I don't think that I could have been as prepared for it as I had hoped. In the middle of the night, he came in the room and he had something in his hand. He came in as if I wasn't home and what my friend had said was right. It was like I was dead asleep. He pulled the blankets off of me and began rubbing me before revealing the object to be a toy. He proceeded to torture me while whispering something that sounded like how he wishes that I loved him and why he can't do this to me when I'm awake. I think this lasted for like half an hour before he ultimately got up and left the room. I was in complete shock that I went straight to the bathroom and puked profusely for what felt like minutes on end. I felt so absolutely violated by this act, but even more, I was fearful of what my roommate was capable of. I never ate another meal from him, and as much as I could, I would either sleep over at a friend's house or have them over with me. I installed a lock on my door to have a key, since the previous door only had those basic locks that can be opened with a screwdriver. I never spoke to my roommate the same, and he noticed this multiple times. He tried to have a sit down with me, as if he was concerned for me, but I always brought up excuses that I'm late for something and needed to leave. I talked to my friend about this, and she forced me to speak with the college. I really didn't want to talk about this, but I eventually did, and I even showed them the footage. I don't know what happened to my roommate afterwards, but he was evicted from the apartment and probably expelled from school. I don't know if he did this to other roommates, if I was the first or the last. If he did this to anybody else, I hope that there were real consequences attached to it, like jail time. It makes me feel weird to say this, but if he does go to jail, 
I hope that he gets the same experience of what he did to me. This story is 100% the truth, and I'd take any lie detector test that was sent my way. We lived in a house that had an outhouse when I was a kid. No indoor toilet. We had running water, but just couldn't get a proper septic system in there. The outhouse was up the hill a ways, about 30 yards. This was in a valley. My nearest neighbor was about four miles away. Good luck if you need an emergency service. We had three dogs. Biggest of all was a lab mix named Boo Bear. I'm gonna try to speed through some of these details, but it'll all make sense at the end. Boo is a very loyal and territorial dog. Didn't matter what time of day it was, he'd go with you up to the outhouse and sit outside to wait. This was normal behavior for years. I'm getting goosebumps thinking about him and welling up with tears too. He was a damn good dog. One night, my mom needed to go and he went out with her. We'd normally just walk up, do our business, head back, and go back to sleep. We had no air conditioning, just windows and fans. Boo followed mom up there, and this time he was between mom and the woods. There was a solid tree line around the house that you couldn't see into, like at all. I've hunted it, but I'd get my ass back to the house before it got even close to dark. Boo felt or heard something out there. The more my mom tried to get up, the more he was growling. He never behaved this way. My mom, a devout Baptist, swears on the Bible that she heard what sounded like grunting coming out of the woods. She could feel something either stomping or punching the ground. My mom was raised by some serious hillbillies and isn't scared of anything in the woods, so she forced her way up there to go to the bathroom. She thought it was a deer, as they'll do that in rut season. Boo sat out there growling and snarling, and my mom said every hair he had on him was standing up straight. He wasn't barking. She could feel his growling, though, like you feel bass from a subwoofer. She got done and came back to the house. No other issues that night. A few nights later, a friend of mine was staying at the house. He grew up poor just like us, but he's a really good dude. His mom and dad were great, too. Anyway, it's about 11 or 11.30, it was Friday or Saturday because we had a 10 p.m. bedtime on weeknights and we were up late playing Killer Instinct on N64. Man, when I say this scared me, I thought my mom was being killed. We heard a scream and felt a noise come from the woods about 150 yards up that mountain. I didn't say shit. I kept playing, thinking that my brain is playing tricks on me. Five minutes later, it happened again. This time, it was maybe 75, maybe 100 yards up, and it was getting closer. I stopped and asked my friend if he heard the same. He said, F yeah, I heard it the first goddamn time too. Man, I can't describe it. Fight or flight kicked in, and we were in a panic. I checked on my mom and my little brother, and both were fine. I woke my little bro up and told him what was going on, and we grabbed our rifles. I only had a 3006, my friend had a 20 gauge, and little bro had a 22. We parked our asses in the room we were in when we first heard it. When I say my heart was racing, if it was doing the 100 meter dash, it'd have beaten Usain Bolt. We didn't hear anything for about 30 minutes, just silence. We had the windows open due to no AC, and we had turned the fans off. We started hearing a noise coming from the woods just pacing. It sounded like something was slowly plodding down the ridge to the house. I know it was no cat. You'll never hear a big cat. I've had cougars surprise me, and I never heard a thing. Whatever this was, it was big, and it made a lot of racket. We just kept sitting there, ears on alert. Another scream. This one shook our windows, literally. Everything shook. There was nothing at that point that we could have done. It was within 25 yards or so of my house, and we were all petrified. Boo was just pacing back and forth. He wanted to get out so badly. 
I didn't want him to go, and neither did his little bro or my friend. He was our safety blanket in that moment. We decided to just hang out in there, and we started hearing grunting. That same grunt that my mom had heard a few nights before. All I can say is that I've heard a deer in rut. This was way too guttural. This freaking feeling of dread came over all of us. We all started bawling. We legit felt like we were going to die. Mom finally woke up and came in the room. She saw us all holding our guns and was like, what are you all doing? I put my hand up to my face. She saw we were crying and I put my index finger to my mouth to say shh. The grunting kept going, louder and louder. Then the pounding started. It wasn't hitting a tree or anything. It was hitting the ground, like punching the holy hell out of it. We could feel each hit. Mom said this was what she had heard the other night, but she didn't think much of it. The shit obviously scarred me. The grunting and pounding stopped. Mom decided to send Boo out. Nikki and Bella, our other dogs, didn't do shit. Boo was just a badass, and we were his family. He beelined it up the ridge. That was it. We heard a single yelp, and then nothing. We didn't hear anything else that night. For several days it was that way. Boo was gone, and we were all shook up. I think it was five or six days later, my stepdad went to use the outhouse, and laying next to the building was Boo. I swear on my life that this dog was literally torn apart. There were no bite marks. It wasn't a cat. He had literally been ripped apart, limb by limb. I don't know what it was. Could have been a bear, but I'm not sure. I know that we moved out of there a month later, and that damn place can't keep people in it anymore. Not sure if it's because of the plumbing, or because there's something else out there. When I was 10, my parents and I went to visit my grandmother for spring break. My cousin also came to visit and we decided we wanted to go to the YMCA for the day. My grandma dropped us off and said she would come back to pick us up in four hours. On that day, the YMCA was empty. There were a couple of adults in the exercise room, but that was it. We went to the basketball court, and after two hours of playing tag and shooting baskets, we got bored. I've never been the biggest fan of swimming, but this YMCA had a pretty cool pool, so we changed into our bathing suits and headed down there. The pool was empty except for the lifeguard. We played a bunch of games, swam laps, but after about an hour, there wasn't much left to do, and there was no one except us to hang out with, so things gradually got less interesting. So we decided to play a game of seeing how long we could hold our breath underwater. We stood in the shallow end, near the clock on the wall, so we could time ourselves. Instead of fully submerging, We just stuck our heads and faces down into the water. We did this a couple of times, and I was winning. On our last round, I felt a tap on my shoulder. I figured it was my cousin giving up and telling me that I won. But instead, it was the lifeguard who told me to knock it off, or she was going to have to ask us to leave the pool. Since we were tired of being in the pool anyway, we figured we would get out, get dressed, and go back to the basketball court until Grandma picked us up. We only had an hour left anyway, and the water was freezing. As we got out, the lifeguard stopped us and asked if we wanted to go into the sauna to warm up and dry off. The sign said 18 years or older, so of course, we were super excited that she allowed us to do that. She walked us to the sauna and unlocked the door. The door was glass, and the interior was made entirely out of wood. Inside, above the door, there was a clock probably to help make sure you were not in there for an unsafe amount of time. The lifeguard stand was adjacent to the sauna, but if you looked out the door, you couldn't clearly see it. She followed us in and went over to the thermometer encased in plastic, unlocked it so she could crank up the heat. I figured that she must have to turn it on each time, so I didn't think anything of it. Both my cousin and I were very short girls, so we couldn't see the temperature that was printed on the thermometer knob 
but I know she was turning it up. Then she left and shut the door behind her. I thought I saw her lock the door too, but then I thought to myself, why would she lock the door when we might need to get out? I checked the clock and decided we should get out in about 10 to 15 minutes. It was already plenty warm in the sauna, but now the room was blazing. It felt nice because I was so cold from the pool. After about 15 minutes though, it was starting to get a little too hot, and my cousin agreed that we should leave so we can get dressed. I went to turn the knob on the door, but it wasn't budging. I thought maybe it was jammed, so I shook it a little bit, but it still wasn't opening, and then I let my cousin try. She couldn't get it open either. We figured the lifeguard would be back in a couple of minutes, so we sat back down and waited. The room was getting hotter now too, and I just wanted to leave. I got up and started banging on the door, shaking and twisting the knob trying to get the lifeguard's attention. My cousin got up and joined me. We started screaming at the top of our lungs for her to let us out, but she just stared straight ahead. I don't think there's any way that she couldn't have noticed or heard two little girls banging and kicking the door, all the while screaming their heads off. Now, we had been in there for about 25 minutes. It was so hot in the sauna that it hurt to breathe. It felt like my lungs were on fire. My eyes and skin were burning. We sat back down and put our towels over our heads because they were still a little damp and it made it just a little easier to breathe. I was so worried about my cousin and she's a couple years younger than me. I looked at the clock and saw that we had been in there for 35 minutes now. I got up and walked to the door again and saw the lifeguard still just staring straight ahead. Again, I tried to get her attention by screaming that we needed out and banging on the door as hard as I could, but still nothing. I was starting to get pretty dizzy, so I went to go sit back down, but the wooden seats of the sauna burned my skin. My towel was completely dry, so I put it underneath me to sit on. My hair was also dry, but I wrapped it across my face to cover my nose and I squinted my eyes so that they didn't burn as bad, but I could still watch if anyone walked past the door. It helped a little bit. My cousin was laying face down with a towel over her head, not moving or saying anything, so I nudged her to make sure that she was still okay. She was, but I could tell that we really needed to get out of there soon, because she seemed a bit disoriented. It had been 45 minutes now, and I was extremely nauseous. There was no way that lifeguard would forget that we were in there, and I hoped with every fiber of me that she would have to come back soon. But there was this little voice in my head telling me, maybe she purposely locked us in there. Finally, a man walked past the door towards the pool, but for some reason, I just couldn't get up. My whole body was on fire, and I felt so dizzy. Luckily, this man wasn't going to the pool. He wanted to be led into the sauna, and came back with the lifeguard. I saw them walking this way, and I immediately jumped up to grab my cousin. I knew now that for sure she had locked us in there, because she had to pull out her keys in order to unlock the door and let this man in. I didn't want to take any chances of us being trapped in there any longer, so as the man was trying to walk in, I was trying to shove our way out. As we were going out, the lifeguard started trying to shut the door and push us back with it. The man was clearly confused about what was going on and said, um, I think they want out. The lifeguard let out a sigh and opened the door fully as we ran away as fast as we could into the changing room. We only had about 10 minutes before our grandmother was supposed to pick us up. We were both so shaken by what had just happened that we didn't say anything to each other as we got dressed or even on the car ride home. When we got back to the house, my parents were making us dinner and I told them the story of what just happened. They thought that I must have been exaggerating, and they didn't believe me. I truly think that that woman was going to let us cook alive in there. The only bit of doubt that I have is what would have happened if we actually died. She obviously would have gotten the blame. What was her endgame here? I'm 21 now, but I think about this interaction all the time, and when I'm in small spaces or I get too warm, I still have panic attacks. No one believes this story, and I get it, it's pretty absurd. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to ask for opinions, but do you think that this could have been some crazy misunderstanding? 
Or do you think that she really just left us in there to die? And why? This story happened relatively recently, and I'm hoping there's a technical explanation for it. So here goes. I manage a small team of four people. Three of them were working in the office with me one day, while the fourth was working from home. Let's call her Lisa. There was nobody else in the office, so we were the only people on site. We held a team meeting in the conference room and connected with Lisa on Microsoft Teams so she'd be included. My laptop was plugged into a large TV monitor so I could share my screen as well as the audio. Towards the end of the meeting, I asked if anyone had any questions. There was silence in the conference room and silence on Teams. Amidst the silence, we hear a faint voice say, I don't understand. It sounded like a small child fussing. All eyes in the conference room darted around, although it was clear that the sound came from the TV. Lisa has a five-year-old daughter, so I laughed and said, Hey, Lise, is your daughter trying to join the meeting? To our surprise, she goes, She isn't home. She's at school. Stunned, all of us in the conference room exchange glances. Lisa then says, Wait, that voice didn't come from the conference room? I explained that the four of us were the only ones here, and that Lisa was the only one on the team session. We all agreed on the phrase we heard, and that it sounded like a young, cranky child. Lisa was home alone. The rest of us were all alone in the office. No other devices were connected to the TV, and nobody had any other devices out during the meeting that would explain the voice. There were no other programs open on my or Lisa's laptops during the meeting. We were all sober, alert, and oriented, yet we all heard the same thing. Has anyone else experienced a disembodied voice on a web conference? Maybe hacking or signal interference? Either way, whatever it was, it was creepy as hell to hear in the middle of a workday. This happened to me a few years back. I was living on my own in the city and was unemployed at the time, usually out looking for work and trying to keep myself busy. One early afternoon, I was heading back to my neighborhood after running some errands downtown and boarded a tram that would take me almost all the way home. There was a park that I would have to cross between the stop and my house, but crossing it would only take a few minutes. So I board the tram, which was mostly empty. Besides me, there was one younger man in the second carriage and the driver up front in the first. I find an empty two-seater. The rows are quite narrow, but I'm comfortable enough. I put my earbuds in and look out the window as we start moving out of downtown and towards home. We pass a couple of stops and don't pick up any new passengers. There had probably been a tram right in front of us who took all of the people, so it was particularly empty compared to normal. At the third stop, though, the doors open behind me. I don't pay it much mind until a stocky man, average height, probably in his 50s, with neat short hair, and an inconspicuous-looking outfit suddenly sit down on the seat next to me. Now this is very strange. We're in a country where social conventions dictate that you don't sit next to someone on public transport unless there are no other options left. And given that the rows are very narrow, this guy is basically trapping me where I'm at. I can't get past him without his cooperation. He greets me with a huge smile and says hi as he sits down. As women, we know the risk of rejecting men and are conditioned to be pleasant, for society and for our own safety. But on this particular day, being down about not finding work and it being broad daylight, I decide that I don't want to play along. I just want to listen to my music and I don't like this man's vibe. I tell him that I'm not in the mood to talk and that he needs to go sit somewhere else. Wrong answer. This man goes from zero to a hundred in 0.2 seconds, and his face contorts with rage as he starts yelling at me from the top of his lungs. You're a terrible person. You don't clean yourself, and you stink of sweat. I didn't, but he did. He goes on and on about what an abomination of a person I am, and I have sort of a freeze reaction. Inside, 
I'm getting very scared. I start looking for a way out, but I'm trapped. I look over to the young man who's no more than a dozen feet away, hoping that he'll come to my rescue. I can tell that he's hoping to stay out of it, but after I've been screamed at for maybe two whole minutes, he finally says meekly, you better calm down, which of course doesn't help at all. So he just gives up and goes back to whatever he was doing, probably just looking at his phone. My next hope is that the driver might react as he has a clear view to the back of the tram, and there's no way he's not hearing what's going on. But again, nothing. The stocky man, maybe frustrated that I'm not reacting to his insults, escalates the abuse and starts screaming that he's going to kill me. At this point I have to do something, and unconsciously, I decide that the only way is to go through him. I'm so done with this situation, so before I even realize what I'm doing, I get up and push right past him. It was pure survival instinct in the moment. Scared that he's going to follow me, I move quickly towards the front of the tram. He gets up and does just that, following me, all red-faced, shouting how he knows where I live and that I need to clean myself behind my ears, that I stink and he's going to f***ing kill me. Again, the driver does nothing. As we pull up to the next stop, which is a stop before mine, I wait until the very last moment before I ask the driver to let me out the front door, which he does. I slip out quickly in hope of escaping without being followed. I don't dare take the time to look over my shoulder. I just hurry down the steps and away from the stop. I'm so scared, and only when the tram has left the station do I take a second to look around me and notice that he's not there. A brief sense of relief washes over me before I start worrying that he's going to get off at the next stop, which is normally mine, and that he will be waiting for me there. It should come as no surprise that I don't want this guy to follow me through the park or to know where I live. So I spend a good hour just walking around, trying to get my nerve system out of panic mode and stay close to shops where there are other people around before I finally decide to make my way home. So there's one time that I put my own comfort and needs before those of a stranger and didn't reject them in a pleasant and non-confrontational manner. I learned that this is like playing Russian roulette and I got the bullet. I learned that you can't count on the kindness of strangers in the company of cowards, you're simply on your own. Never saw that man again, but if I were ever to catch whiff of him anywhere near me, I would surely change my travel plans in the moment and exit whatever tram, train, or bus I found myself in. I never want to feel that feeling of being trapped by that smelly man ever again. This one time, I was walking home from the train station after I spent the weekend at my aunt's house. It was about 11 p.m. and very dark outside. When I was almost home, I noticed a guy on crutches in front of me who was walking the same direction and then stopped every couple of meters to turn around and look at me before continuing to walk. Since he was walking with a limp, I quickly passed him. When I did, he stopped walking and grinned at me in a very creepy manner. I kept moving, since I lived in an apartment over a burger restaurant. For a moment, I considered to ask one of the employees to walk with me to my front door, because to get to the entrance of the apartment, you had to walk around the building into a dark court. I didn't end up asking though, because I thought, what could possibly happen? The guy's on crutches, and I didn't want to come across as childish. So I was walking through the court of our house, and wanted to pull out my keys while walking. Suddenly, I couldn't find them in my handbag. I realized then that I had thrown them somewhere into my travel bag because I didn't want to risk losing them while I was at my aunt's. So, still standing in the middle of the court, I had to search the whole travel bag for that damn key. I was so caught up by the whole search that I totally forgot about the creepy guy that I had just encountered. When I finally pulled the key out of the bag, I looked up and the creepy guy from before was standing right in front of me, grinning. I always thought in a situation like this that I'd start screaming, but instead, I couldn't get myself to make any sound at all. With the keys in my hand, I started running to the front door. I opened it 
and jumped inside the house. The guy, still walking with a limp, followed me as fast as he could. Luckily, due to his injury, he just wasn't as fast as me. Unfortunately for me, though, our front door was one of those doors that slowly fall into the lock automatically, and when you try to push them to make them shut quicker, it pressures back at you and stops you from slamming it. So there I was, trying to push the door into the lock, while Creepy Guy was on his way to follow me into the house. Just as his hand was set to reach the door, it fell into the lock. Through the glass, we just looked at each other, both breathing heavily from the race, a look of disappointment spreading quickly across his face. I quickly ran upstairs to my apartment and locked myself in. Later that night, I looked outside my window to see that same man walking up and down the road in front of the house. He stayed there for about three to four hours after the incident. I can't tell you what it was that made me not call the cops. I guess I was like, after all, nothing happened. What could they do about it? After that, I didn't feel safe in my house anymore because I knew that he knew where I lived. I only left my apartment when being picked up or dropped off and made sure to be home before it was turning dark every day for the next two weeks. Finally, I did decide to go to the police and tell them about it to ask whether they can keep a special eye on the neighborhood for a bit. I went to the police station and the way it transpired was exactly how I feared it would. They took notes and said, mm, we can't really do anything about this now. You should have called before, but we'll make a note of it. A couple days passed and suddenly I get a call back from another police officer who asked me a lot about what happened. He then tells me that they've been looking for the guy on crutches for months already because he had assaulted several girls in our town, followed them into their apartments, and even slept on their doorsteps. He had been in police custody before, got out, and violated his probation. He had some kind of mental illness, although this wasn't an excuse for his behavior. The police officer told me to immediately call in case the guy showed up again. He luckily never did. It was only then that I understood the seriousness of the situation and realized that I most likely escaped an attempted assault in some sort of way, by no more than an inch. I, in a way, really didn't believe myself that the whole thing had actually happened before the police guy called me back. This was five years ago, but I still think about it from time to time and it still gives me the utter creeps. Sometimes I kick myself for not going to the police right away, but then in other times, I'm just glad that I didn't do a better job at hiding my keys from myself that night. All right, this happened to me about three years ago. It was brought up recently with my friends and they suggested that I post it. I've gone through therapy for this and trained in firearms because this was the creepiest night of my life. I spent a night in what felt like a horror movie and it's still just so vivid. It was a Wednesday night in the summer. I was off work, my husband was out of town, and our son was staying at his grandma's for the night. I was home alone with my dogs, an 80 pound Aussie mix and my 80 pound German Shepherd Pitbull mix. For a little context, I always have issues sleeping when I'm home alone so I tend to just binge watch TV in the living room until I can't keep my eyes open anymore. This particular night, I remembered that the trash pickup comes the next day. I decided to turn on Game of Thrones for a bit, and then I would take the trash out. All of a sudden, I realize that it's 1.30 a.m., and I still haven't taken the trash to the curb. My house has two solid iron gates, one in the front and one to the side door slash backyard. Lighting on our street, or anywhere in our neighborhood, isn't that great, but it's a quiet neighborhood with lots of families, and you rarely hear about crime here. I looked out the window by habit before I took the trash out and saw who I thought was my neighbor, smoking a cigarette outside of his gate across the street, looking directly at me. For context, this is a normal occurrence. My neighbor across the street hides smoking cigarettes from his wife, so he typically does it late at night in front of his gate. I get off of work late, so I usually see him. We wave, say hi, chat a little bit, and then I go inside. 
he always makes the joke, you didn't see me smoking if my wife asks. So unbothered by seeing the guy, I go outside, grab my trash cans, open my squeaky iron gate, and take them out to the curb. I didn't have my glasses on at the time, so as usual, I waved and said hello. However, the guy, who I thought was my neighbor, threw down the cigarette and quickly walked off down the street. It took a minute for me to register that he was not my neighbor. I was a little creeped out because he was clearly staring into my window from the opposite sidewalk. But also, maybe it was just a guy taking a night walk, not unusual in our neighborhood, and he had just stopped for a cigarette. I thought I probably weirded him out just as much as he weirded me out. I went back inside, laid on the couch with my dogs to keep watching Game of Thrones. At some point, I fell asleep, and I woke up to hearing my gate squeak, in addition to hearing my German Shepherd mix growling. He's extremely protective of our family at home, but he's also the kind of dog that you can take anywhere because he's so friendly in public. My Aussie mix is a bit more passive, but his sheer size and scary bark tends to deter people, even though he's very friendly. I quickly got up, pulled back my curtain. My gate was still shut, and I didn't see a thing. My dog, however, continued to growl. I looked out another window which had a better view of my front yard and porch. I didn't see anything there either. Eventually, my dog settled back down with my other dog, but I was still uneasy. I ended up watching TV again, because I couldn't go back to sleep. About an hour later, I definitely heard my gate squeak. We're the only ones with a heavy cast iron gate, and the noise it makes is so distinct. So I look out the curtain while my dogs are continuing to softly growl. My gate is halfway open this time, but I don't see anyone. At this point, I'm panicking. In my panic, I couldn't find my phone. I grabbed a wooden baseball bat out of our room, crouched down, and started going through the couch cushions to find my phone. My dogs are oddly still quietly growling instead of barking, so I assumed that no one was there. The minute I find my phone though, my front door handle starts shaking. I run to the side door to let my German Shepherd mix out. I know he'll protect me, and he can jump the six foot back gate. My Aussie mix is going crazy, and he bursts out one of our door side lights. I heard the guy say, And immediately, I let out my German Shepherd mix. I jumped up to look out the window, saw my dog latch onto the guy's hand. The guy starts screaming and takes off down the street, my dog chasing him every step of the way. I then become terrified that he'll hurt my dog, so I run outside with my baseball bat, screaming my dog's name over and over. The next thing I know, my dog is prancing down the street back to me, happy as shit, blood all over his face. I called the police. They took another hour or so to show up and didn't seem to take me too seriously. They said they'd call local hospitals, but I never heard back. I called my husband bawling and he got on the next flight home. I ended up staying at his mom's for a few days, too terrified to go home. I did buy my dog's giant ribeyes for being so good and saving me. I don't know what that guy wanted, but I think he knows that whatever he wanted It's not worth coming back to the house for. This story goes back to the year 2015. It was around 8 p.m., and because it was summer, it had just begun getting dark. I live in a town where crime almost never happens. It's a very safe rural area with few people. Here, all the shops close early, so that night, I went shopping around 7.40, and everything was quiet. I didn't have enough money to pay, but the shopkeeper knew me and my family and knew that I'd be right back to settle my bill. So I got home, gathered the rest of my cash, and headed back out to the store. I was listening to music. I had bought new headphones and was trying them out. I was about two blocks from my house when a motorcycle with two men came out of nowhere. The man got off the back, and took out a gun, pointing it directly at my head, yelling at me to give him everything that I had. My cell phone, my wallet, give me everything, give me everything, he exclaimed. I just squeezed my cell phone 
and headphones and yelled, no, these are my things, over and over again. The whole time, that gun was pointed at my face from about a foot away, maybe even less. When the guy with the gun saw that I wasn't going to give him anything, he fired. I saw very clearly how he pulled the trigger on the gun. He got back on the motorcycle with the other man, and they left at full speed. As my brain caught up with my eyes, I realized that the gun never fired. I don't know if it was real or fake, if it had bullets in it or not. I don't know anything. It was just after dark. My vision was a little obscured. But this has to be the most terrifying experience that I've ever had. As soon as they pulled off, I ran to the store where I was heading to. I arrived crying and shaking. It was hard for me to speak. I asked for help, and they called my mom who came to pick me up in a taxi because I didn't want to walk home, even though it was only four blocks away. That was the first and last time I experienced a robbery attempt. It was the most damn stressful situation I've ever been through. I don't know how to describe the absolute panic I felt when I saw the barrel of a gun in front of my eyes, and all for a cheap cell phone and some headphones. They didn't give a shit about a girl's life. They put a gun to my face. I wish that no one has to go through this, much less children. I was lucky, but many are not. I know now that I should have just given up what they were asking for. No possessions are worth my life, but try telling that to a 15-year-old when this is all that they have. All this happened almost a decade ago. It still gives me chills every now and then whenever I happen to think about what if that gun did fire. When I was a kid, my mom worked as a teacher and she was very close to a coworker of hers who had a son that was around my age and whom I was very close with as well. When my mom or her friend would head out for the night, the other would take care of both of us kids. And basically, it meant I spent half my time over there, and my friend spent half his time at my house, which was perfect and fun for us. We lived in different cities, but since that kind of system had been going on pretty much since forever, I grew up knowing my friend's city just as well as mine. His mom was well aware of that. So with that being said, whenever we were going on a walk in their area, She'd let us wander around because she knew we'd always find our way back to her. My mom, though, was more cautious and always kept an eye on us, as she'd walk behind us to make sure she was always able to see us. I just wish her friend would have done the same. One day, I had to be around six or seven. We were going on a walk with my friend Marcus and his mom Katie. It was a very sunny day, and I was wearing a dress with embroidered flowers and I had my blonde, long hair down. I often heard that I was a pretty kid, even from strangers in the street. And besides making me and my parents somewhat uncomfortable, nothing bad had ever happened. During that walk, Katie was walking ahead of us, and I was chatting and just fooling around with Marcus, when he suddenly remembered something urgent to tell his mom, as urgent as something can be for an eight-year-old boy. He ran up to her, and left me strolling behind for a couple of moments, just as it already had happened a hundred times before. That time, though, we were circling around a big camping site, and we walked by the white vans and camping cars. One of those vans had its back doors open, and there was a man, probably in his 40s, smoking a cigarette and leaning out of the vehicle. He locked eyes with me as I was approaching, then saw that Katie and Marcus weren't paying much attention to me, as they were already a couple of meters ahead. He proceeded to pull me by my arm close to him, so I found myself with my body touching his. So weirded out that I didn't even say a word, although I knew Katie would have heard me if I called for help. He leaned toward me, as he was obviously much taller than I was, muttering something that I didn't understand. He winked at me, and kissed me on the lips, then pulled me to the open doors of his van. At this point, if he had pushed me just a little, I would have fallen in the truck. Out of fear, I was too terrified to even lift a finger, 
and even though I didn't understand everything that was going on, I knew that it wasn't okay. He put his hands on the door, as if to close the vehicle, and I felt my heart sink. At that exact moment, some other man jogged towards us, in his 40s as well, waving hello to me and saying something along the lines of, I lost sight of you for a bit. I was so scared. He had a friendly look on his face and was staring at me with great insistence and a huge reassuring smile. The van man awkwardly laughed and yanked me out of the way of the car, slamming the door shut. I ran to Katie as I heard the van go off and just acted as if nothing had happened. To this day, I never told that story to anybody, not to Katie or Marcus, not to my mom, nobody. I'm 22 years old now. So to the friendly guy who obviously didn't lose sight of me or whatever, but probably just saw everything and wanted to interfere. From the bottom of my heart, I thank you. To the pedophile who surely would have abducted me and who was strangely okay with kissing a kid in public and in broad daylight, I wish you nothing but the worst. And I pray that we never meet again. Although I think I'd be too old for you now. My name is Lisa, and I'll tell you my story, which I describe as truly terrifying and unfortunately still affects my life today. You will understand why soon. I decided to share this story because it took place exactly two years ago, and because I think it can serve to awaken the prudence of some, especially in this period where the days are shortening. To put into context, this happened October 1st, 2020, in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. I was 17 at the time, and had just left my small hometown, a place near Paris, for a provincial town to continue my studies. This was my first time being away from my family, about four hours by train. So I was looking for an apartment, a place to call my own, but I found the prices to be rather unaffordable. So I decided to find roommates instead. I settled in a brand new student residence in the heart of the rich bourgeois residential pavilion. It was a beautiful area, especially compared to the neighborhoods that I would have had to find an apartment in if I were paying for a single by myself. Everything starts out fine. I go to school, but right from the beginning, the teachers let us know that unlike students in other disciplines, we will have classes in person and not remote. So it's likely that we'll be the only students on this part of campus. In short, the first classes are going pretty well, even though I'm slightly awkward and have a little trouble fitting in with the others. There's also this black shadow. On Thursdays and Fridays, I finish at 8 p.m., which means my return to my residence is around 8.45. That allows for time to wait for the train that didn't pass often during the pandemic and to make the three stops before walking 10 minutes to my house. I typically walk alone on my way to and from school, but in the week of September 1st to the 27th, going to class in the morning, I came across a man three times the same man dressed in black, wearing a hood, and whose face I could not really distinguish. What bothered me at the time was the fact that it didn't fit in with the neighborhood's chic environment, but I'm not focusing on that per se. The night of October 1st. As usual, I leave school, but unlike other days, I take the train about an hour later than I normally do. I had finally made a friend whom I had discussed taking the bus home with, so I thought that he'd be joining me. But unfortunately, that didn't click. So as usual, I end up waiting alone. And once I'm in the train, I realize that it's just me and the driver. There's nobody else here. So I decided to sit in the four seat squares to make myself comfortable. At the next stop, which is still in the campus area, I turn my head just as the doors automatically close and my eyes cross that of a man sitting alone in black. As our eyes catch, the man stands, puts his hand between the doors that were already closing, and enters. While the train is empty, he chooses to sit right in front of me. Intimidated and understanding that the situation is suspicious, I look away. I prefer to look out the window anyway. The more time passes, the more my instinct leads me to believe that this man may have bad intentions. In my head, I begin to develop a plan to ensure that this person doesn't follow me when I have to get off the tram. 
Once the train arrives at its destination, I decide to leave at the last possible moment. Just as the doors begin to close, I jet from my seat and rush out the door. As I begin walking, I hear a cry and I turn my head. I see the man who managed to get out, but obviously pinched his fingers while trying to block the door. The man then begins to walk behind me. This time I'm sure, I'm being followed. As I accelerate the pace, I hear the man do the same. I can even hear his breath inching nearer. At this point, nearly in a panic, I decide to feign a phone call. Perhaps the sound of me talking to somebody may do enough to scare him away. As I begin to fake a conversation, the man turns away. Success. But no sooner do I lift my phone to my face, does it actually start to ring. I believe that he heard this and quickly understood the deceptive move that I had just pulled. As I turn around to acknowledge whether or not he's still following me, I see that he has taken something out of his pocket and slipped it into his hand. It's dark out so I can't exactly tell what it is, but I know that it's meant for me. In that moment, he starts screaming and rushing after me. I take off down the street in a full sprint at this point. I end up running into one of my roommates who happens to be out with a group of his friends. I throw myself into his arms and say something to the effect of, it's great to see you. I've had a rough day and I'm really glad that I found you. I'm glad that my roommate is so perceptive because he knew that something was wrong. As I threw myself at him, he saw the man that had been rushing at me moments before reverse course after being just a few meters behind me. I turned to look over my shoulder one final time before walking off, just in time to see that man duck down an alley, never to be seen by me again. Later that night, in my room alone, I'm crying as I realize what had just almost occurred. I think back about the actions, and I realize that that was the same man that I had seen three times last week. I decide then that I'm going to make a statement to the police. The next day, I was notified that the surveillance videos of the train had revealed the identity of the person. He was a wanted man for assault and armed robbery. Apparently, he took pleasure in assaulting rich girls to humiliate them, physically victimizing them before stealing from them. That's why he prowled in my neighborhood. It made my blood run cold, and I decided then to go home to my parents. Apparently the man was found two weeks later in another city after assaulting a young girl in a store. The moral of the story, pay attention to yourself, especially at night. And above all, nothing is better than to follow your instinct. My roommate and I have talked about this night several times because he's told me that the look on my face that night sticks with him to this day. He had never seen such fear on a human's face before. While nothing terrible happened to me in this story, it's definitely kicked up a feeling of distrust. I constantly remain on guard, especially when it comes to meeting people with hoodies on. And now I keep pepper spray in my bag, because you never know what lurks on the next train. This happened three nights ago, and I'm going crazy trying to figure it out. I just moved into a new apartment about a month ago, and I'm still unpacking and settling in. I've been using my parents' address as my mailing address, and they live a few towns over, maybe about 20 minutes, and I've been using this address all my life. Three nights ago, my parents called me at 2 a.m., freaked out, and they proceeded to tell me this story. Apparently, about an hour before, someone starts banging on their front door and repeatedly ringing the doorbell. My stepdad walks downstairs opens the door, leaving the front glass door closed and locked. There was a man standing outside, who looked to be in his 30s, wearing a black hoodie with a hood pulled up around his face. He didn't have any distinguishing facial features, facial hair, or tattoos. The only thing my stepdad said was that he looked to be Hispanic. Neither my stepdad or my mother, who was watching the whole thing out the window, recognized the man. He says, I'm so sorry to bother you, but I'm looking for my full name. My stepdad plays dumb and says, who? The man proceeds to state my full name again and says that my boyfriend is worried because I didn't come home that night. He claims to be a friend of my boyfriend, 
and tells my stepdad that they are both out looking for me, worried because I didn't show up at home. Now, I don't have a boyfriend. I live by myself, with my three dogs, and haven't been in a relationship for the past five to six months. Here's the weird part. My stepdad asked the guy what boyfriend he was talking about, and the man tells him the name of the boyfriend that I had when I was in 10th grade, nearly 20 years ago. My boyfriend in the 10th grade has a very, very unique Italian name. I'd never met anyone with a full name even close to his. He says my high school boyfriend's name a few more times to ensure my stepdad heard him, and repeats that they're very worried about me. Is my stepdad sure that I'm not inside? At this point, my stepdad is thoroughly weirded out and closes and locks the door in his face. The man doesn't leave, though. He lingers in front of my parents' house for the next 10 minutes, smoking cigarettes and talking on the phone. Finally, my parents call the cops. About five minutes before the cops arrive, the man walks down to the dead end of their block and then drives away in a silver car. My stepdad was unable to get the license plate my parents file a police report, and nothing else happens. After I hear this story, I'm going nuts over the weird details. How would someone know who I dated nearly 20 years ago, and what would the motive be of making up a story that included that weird detail about my past? I haven't had contact with a 10th grade boyfriend in over a decade. Yesterday I decided to message him on Facebook to see if he has any insight. I tell him the whole story, and he's just as confused as I am and also claims to have no part in it. I'm at a loss. I'm also really freaked out that some strange man is going through that much trouble at 1 a.m. to look for me. Any insights or ideas would be greatly appreciated because I'm literally racking my brain trying to figure out what this was all about. Around 2015 or 2016, I moved to Florida from California to go to college. I was about 18 at the time. I was staying in a small studio by myself, pretty far from the university, but close enough to where my apartment was considered the hangout spot. To paint a picture of how it looked, it was in the shape of a rectangle with only one window. So you walk in, and it's the living area, then the kitchen, then the bathroom, with closets on the right side of the wall. One particular night, I had about six friends over at my apartment. It was four guys and three girls total, including me. We were partaking in illegal activities, drinking and smoking. We were all under 21. So when I got a knock on my door, I thought it was a neighbor about to complain either about the smell or the noise. I checked the peephole and saw a lady, whom I instantly recognized as a panhandler that's always at the corner street of my apartment complex. So I opened the door and asked her if I could help her with anything. She had a towel over her shoulder and said, Hey, I've been going around door to door, but everyone keeps turning me away. I was wondering if I could please just take a shower. I promise I don't want anything else. I just want to clean myself. Any sane person would have said no and told her to keep it moving. But I was a dumb 18-year-old empath that was high as balls and also silently panicking at the moment. So I said yes, and I walked her into my bathroom, told her how to turn on the water, where the soap was, and walked out. The look of terror on my friends' faces was priceless. All at once, they started asking why I had done that, and if I realized how dangerous the situation could be. Was there someone waiting for her outside? Did she have a gun? Was she about to try and rob us? One of them even went to the kitchen to grab all the knives and then hid them just in case she tried anything. Then we all went quiet, just anxiously waiting for her to finish showering. When she was done, she came out of the restroom. I walked her to the door. She said, may God bless you. And I never saw her again. Not outside, not at the corner. You could say what I did was stupid but I know that I have some good karma coming my way one day. I've got a friend, 25 and female, from college that told me a harrowing story that happened to her and her friends back in high school. She's from Buffalo, New York, 
and often went on camping trips to local upstate campgrounds. When she was a senior, her and four of her friends went to a campsite fitted with rows of cabins on the water that people could rent. As the sun went down, the girls noticed that their neighbors a few cabins down, a group of guys similar in age, were playing music and grooving around the campfire, drinking some beers. One of the guys asked them all if they wanted to join. When they got over there and started hanging with the guys, everything seemed completely normal and everyone was having a good time. As the night progressed though, one of the guys there started to get blackout drunk and eventually pulled out a revolver that he said belonged to his dad. He started waving it around and playing with it. This obviously freaked everybody out, his own friends included. Eventually, he started pointing the gun at his head while laughing. His friends were yelling at him to put it away and how this wasn't very funny. The girls at this point were fairly disturbed and told the guys that they should get back to their cabin and said their goodbyes. When they got back to their cabin, they all talked about how freaky that whole experience was and expressed some concern for the drunk guy. They then moved on to other topics and forgot about it for the time being. A few hours later, sometime in the middle of the night, they heard a loud bang coming from the direction of their neighbor's cabin. Shortly after this, an entire squad of cop cars showed up to the scene. One officer came to my friend's cabin and began asking them questions about the cabin that they had visited earlier in the night. When my friend asked the officer what happened, he explained that a kid had shot himself in the head in front of his friends. They weren't able to discern if it was purposeful or accidental. My friend to this day still has PTSD over this incident and explained that she rarely goes camping anymore because of it. You just never know what's going to happen next door. This all happened to me just a few days ago, while I was on my way home from visiting a friend's house. I was driving on a back road late at night in my Tesla Model 3 while I was using the autopilot feature. I'll admit that I wasn't paying the most attention to the road because I was on my phone and I had my music playing in the car. The ride was going smooth, nothing out of the ordinary, until the trip was anything but ordinary. Out of nowhere, my car immediately began to break, and an alarming sound was made. It startled me as I took control of the wheel and looked through the windshield. When I saw a figure standing just inches from my car, barely avoiding being hit, my heart was racing from the near impact, and now seeing what I could only assume to be a person standing out there in the middle of nowhere. They didn't even flinch as I almost barreled into them. I stared at them for a good 10 seconds, before I put my car into park and turned on the megaphone to ask if they were okay. They didn't respond, just proceeded to walk to my driver's side window. I'm glad that I lock my doors whenever I get into my car because I was terrified at this moment and I don't know if I had the wits to do it myself then. That's when they decided to speak. They asked me if I could roll the window down to speak to them, but I refused and told them that I could hear them just fine through the window. I then asked why they were out there all alone, in the cold, by themselves, and they told me that their car had broken down and that they were hoping someone would stop to help them. As they were talking, I got a good look at their face. He appeared to be a man, 25 to 30 years old, not the most well-kept, but also didn't look super ratty. He asked what my name was. I told him that it was Rebecca, and he told me that his name was Ashton. After that small talk they attempted, I told them that I would be calling someone to come assist them with their situation. They weren't happy with this, and instead insisted that I drop them off at a friend's house who lived nearby. This is when red flags really started rattling off in my head and something appeared suspicious. They had told me that they were waiting for someone to come and help, but now they needed to be dropped off nearby. I decided to put my car back into drive and told them again that I would call someone to help them. That's when they tried to reach for the door handle, although I guess they didn't know that Tesla handles are embedded into the car. As he did that, I immediately stepped down on the pedal and went flying down the road. I didn't even bother to look in my rearview mirror or put the car back into autopilot. 
The whole ride back, I was scared shitless. I got back onto the main road, where I hoped to see cars, and just continued to floor at home. I couldn't get my mind off this for the rest of the night. I have suspicions that the guy was not out there alone, and that there were other people with him just out of sight. I pray that they didn't get someone else who just wasn't as lucky as me. I believe this to be the last time that I ever stopped to try and help a random person ever again. This story takes place several years ago, but I'd be lying if I said that I didn't think about it regularly. I was at home alone one evening when I heard a knock at the back door. This confused me as no one ever used that door. My husband and I lived in a fourplex at the time and all of the units had a back door at the top of a narrow staircase. These doors were a little inconvenient to access as you'd have to go around the building and up the narrow set of stairs as opposed to the wider main entrance at the front. It didn't make sense to use that back entrance and I couldn't think of anyone who would go to that door to visit. As I approached the back door, I saw two tall men in the window, standing near the door. A chill went down my spine. I didn't feel safe opening the door, so I just called out, Hello? One of the men then tapped on the window. Yes, hello? May we come in? We're with Bresnan. At the time, my husband and I had Bresnan for cable, but it wasn't having any issues. I replied, our cable's perfect. Is there a problem? Ma'am, the man said, can we come in? We're servicing the area and it's important that we look at your cable. I shook my head. We're not having any issues, I repeated, so there's no need to stop by. Ma'am, we're visiting every resident. Let us in so we can do our job. I noticed the man grabbed the doorknob and try to open the locked door. It's at this point that I slowly grabbed a knife from our knife block and held it at my chest. We're not having any problems, I repeated, trying not to convey the shakiness of my voice. So you don't need to be here. The two figures appeared to shuffle and then straighten. Ma'am, let us in. We're on a deadline and we need to do our job. I glanced at the clock gauging when my husband would arrive home from work, gripping the knife tighter by the moment. Ma'am? Ma'am? I saw him try the doorknob again. I closed my eyes and felt overwhelming gratitude of always locking my doors. Just then, a thought came to the forefront of my mind. I'm sorry, I can't help you. Could I please get your names and badge numbers? I can give your supervisor a call to let them know our cable is fine. I heard another shuffle. And then one of the men replied, No need to, ma'am. We're sorry we wasted your time. With that, both of the men exited the staircase and disappeared into the night. Shaken up, I held the knife tight and tried to get my bearings. I remember making a mental note to call the cable company or the police, but my hands were shaking so badly I couldn't hold onto the phone. With the knife still grasped to my chest and the phone falling out of my other hand, I sank to the floor and cried. When my husband returned home, I told him what had happened. I was still very shaken up and had started crying again after he came home. We then immediately called the Bresnan Cable Company and spoke to a representative who informed us that no one from their company was out on assignment in our area. The next day, we asked our neighbors if they had a visit from the company and no one else had. It gets said a thousand times here but let me be one more voice reminding you to always lock your doors. I'm not sure what nefarious purposes those two individuals had for concocting that lie about being with the cable company, but I know that nothing good was gonna come of it and that I wasn't gonna get free HBO out of it. I'm a 22 year old woman and my husband is 25. Last night, he woke me up around 11.50 p.m. to tell me that someone has been knocking on our door and ringing our apartment doorbell for about 10 minutes on and off. He woke me so I could possibly ID the person. Once I looked out our upstairs window, I saw the man walking to his car in our apartment parking lot, which was across the street from our unit. He was wearing blue jeans and a gray t-shirt. 
medium build, maybe 30 years old, and a blonde man. He wasn't covering his face or anything. But the thing is, he was carrying what looked like resistance bands, or maybe even rope. He sat in his car for about three minutes while I was on the phone with dispatch. Then he came back to our door and knocked hard for another few minutes. Dispatch advised me that the police were on their way and they then hung up. I started videoing the vehicle. I read out the tag number, make and model, and just watched as he put his car in park and reverse over and over again. Out of seemingly nowhere, he backed out of the parking lot and started to rush away, but not before the officer arrived and pulled him over. My downstairs neighbor knocked on my door and told me that he had been peering into her little children's windows and was pounding on her door as well. She said that her husband had left about one minute before he started knocking at the door. She said he saw her children through the window and that's why he continued knocking. Our doors are right next to one another so he probably didn't know what door he wanted open. He had been watching us as well through our upstairs window. So I turned off all of the lights, shut the blinds, all while I called the police. The police never contacted us for a statement though. I've reached out to the dispatch about any update and I'm waiting to see if any action was taken. We're keeping our eyes peeled to see if he's been following us. I'm replacing my porch light bulbs with motion detectors and putting bars in our windows and door tracks. Both my neighbor and my family are panicked, to say the least. He had to have been outside of our house for about 25 to 30 minutes total. In the time since, I haven't heard anything from the police, but I did look back at the video that I took, and I remember that car. I was walking my dog at 8 p.m. about a week ago for him to go to the bathroom, and this car was driving really slowly through our parking lot and parked a few spots down from where I was letting my dog sniff. It just sat there with the car running. When I tell you that my ears started ringing and I got an awful feeling, I'm not joking. I turned around, went home, didn't give my dog a chance to pee, and shut every door and window up tight. I think this man has been staking out our apartment building, both me and my neighbors. Update, after about a week of waiting, I finally heard from the arriving officer that night. He was unsurprisingly vague this entire conversation, but suffice it to say, the answers that I got to my questions were far from satisfactory. After he pulled the man over, he simply let him go. When I asked why he would do such a thing when he was obviously prowling, possibly with restraints in his possession, the police officer simply said, the man had a lot of different possessions in his car and the officer wouldn't be able to prove that any of them were with criminal intent. When I asked what purpose, if any, this man would have for knocking so late at night on doors while also lurking around windows, the officer said that the man had stated that he was there to meet somebody off of a dating app and that he was forthcoming with the information, so the officer felt comfortable to let him go. As we get off the phone, I feel that my blood is starting to boil. I can't help but feel like the police response to this whole situation was incredibly lackluster. While I have no confirmation for what I'm about to say, it's in my heart of hearts that this man had the worst intentions in mind and that he was likely trying to gain entry into the apartment that had those children in it. Lock your doors, everybody. I'm gonna start this off by saying I don't live in the best area, but it's close to my kid's school and it's what we can afford. So it's the middle of the afternoon and I'm in line at a stoplight waiting for it to change so I could get to the school to pick up my older kids. I also had my toddler with me. While I was waiting, I heard my passenger side door handle move like someone was trying to open it. I always lock my car doors out of habit. My car is older, so they don't lock automatically when I start the car like some newer models do. I look over and there's an older woman aggressively trying to open my car door. My window is cracked for a bit of fresh air, but it's not all the way down. She reached up trying to get the window to go down further, but couldn't squeeze her fingers in. She said, excuse me, I need you to help me out. I need a ride. Now, I'm all for helping people, 
but not when they're trying to get into my car with no explanation. Like, you just don't do that. I ask, do you need me to call 911? The woman says, no, you need to help me. Let me in. Come on now, help me out. She pulls on the door again, then alternates with trying to pull the window down. Lucky for me, the light changed at this moment, and I told her, sorry, but I have to go. I can't help you. I seized my opportunity to take off, watching her in the rearview mirror of my car stroll off to the sidewalk until the light turned red again and she crouched down and seemingly crept up to the next unsuspecting car, perhaps to try this whole venture again. As I got further and further away, I lost sight of the intersection, but said a quick prayer in the hopes that this woman doesn't make entry into anybody else's car. Fast forward a few weeks, and the situation has all but left my mind when I'm watching the morning news as I'm getting my children ready for school one day. Apparently an elderly woman had been driving down one of our main streets when all of a sudden her passenger side door was flung open and a disheveled middle-aged woman jumped into the passenger seat. She used a knife to coerce the older woman to drive from ATM to ATM, withdrawing her limit at each spot. When the assailant had all but depleted this older woman's checking account, she escaped with all the funds, but not before physically assaulting the woman for good measure. The police caught up to her a few hours later, taking her into custody with all the money that she had from the crime spree still on her person. I'm sure you can guess by now that the woman displayed on our TV screen was the very same woman that tried to pry her way into my car. I know that having my car doors locked allowed us to dodge a bullet that day, and I still feel terribly for that elderly woman and the things that she had to go through. As children, our parents tell us not to get into cars with strangers. I think the opposite can be just as important. Don't give strangers the opportunity to get into your car. Last year, I was staying in a university hall for my senior year. It's a private building, so not connected to the university and out in the city near the main town. We have a car park, but nobody really uses it because we're all poor students and it costs money to park there. So mine was one of only two or three cars at any given time. The car park isn't well lit and it's to the side of the building. So you have to walk for a minute or two to get to the main door. I was sitting in my car one evening after getting back from the gym, just scrolling on my phone because my seat was warm and it was dark and raining outside. So I couldn't be bothered to get up yet. I was reading an article when somebody started knocking on my window, which was really odd. It was a man dressed all in black. He started telling me how his friend had seen me through the window and thought I was really attractive. So could he have my number? I responded, no. That's a bit odd, and I don't feel comfortable with it. He continued to be insistent for a while, practically begging me to get out and give them my number or my social media details, telling me I should come over and speak to his friend, who was, weirdly, standing at the other end of the car park furthest away from the building. I kept saying no and scrolling on my phone to show that I wasn't interested. He finally relented and walked away. After that exchange, I texted one of my friends to ask if he'd come and get me and walk with me to the building. As I was waiting, this man returned, but now with his hood up, and he began banging loudly on my window, saying that I was being rude, ungrateful, while calling me all other sorts of names as well. I kept staring at my phone and pretended that I couldn't hear him. He then started trying my door handle. After realizing that it was locked, he began violently pushing into my car. I did my best to ignore him and maintain my composure, although I felt rattled to my core. I texted my friend again, asking him to bring other friends with him. My friend was taking a long time to read my message and I was terrified but for some reason I didn't think to call the police, probably because I was scared of things escalating even further. The guy at my window had calmed down after a few minutes and walked off, saying that he'd leave me alone now. However, I watched him out of the corner of my eye, join up with his friend, and then three or four other men emerged from the shadows. They walked so that they were out of sight, but I could still see them lingering as they kind of circled around my car 
and moved towards the building. They lingered for a while, until luckily another car came, which was obviously full of students going to a party, due to the loud music and singing going on inside. This group of men left as they saw these people arrive, so I was able to latch onto the party car of people and make my way inside. Once home, the friend that I had been texting finally responded. He said that he'd actually heard about these guys before. Apparently they'd followed another girl into the building and into the elevator a few days prior, then stood in it making really gross sexual comments towards her. She had to run to her door and lock it, where they then stood outside knocking and whispering for her to open it. We were able to report this to the building, who, to their credit, then hired a permanent set of security staff. We also got the CCTV footage of both incidents and were able to pass this on to the police. So, weird men harassing young women at my university building? Let's never meet, you pervs. I just heard a post earlier tonight that reminded me of this not-so-fun moment that happened last year. At the time, I, a 24-year-old female, had the entire lower-slash-main floor unit that I lived in to myself. I used to bartend-slash-manage a nightclub a few blocks away, and would usually get home around 4 a.m. This night, I had just finished a 12-hour shift, was exhausted and hungry, so I decided to order some food. I place the order, get my joint rolled and ready for when the food arrives, put on a movie, and wait. Eventually, I hear the doorbell ring, and being alone, and it being so late at night, I waited to get the photo sent to the delivery app to verify my food was at the door, not just for the safety, but also so I wouldn't have to make small talk with the driver. Three to five minutes pass, I see a photo of my food on the doorstep and decide to get up to go get it. My bedroom has five large windows that gave me a full view of the path along the house, the main street in front, our garbage area, and the area right in front of our unit's door. The driver is still out there, and now he's texting me to come out and get my food. I tell him he left it in a perfect spot, and that I'll be out shortly to get it, and thanks for delivering. At this point, I'm waiting for him to go because even though weed is legal here, people can still be judgmental and I don't want to go out in my PJs to collect my food, smoke, and see a human after working all night. He doesn't leave, though. He keeps texting me to come outside, and now I can hear him talking to another male voice, although my window view obscures anyone else that might be out there. The food in the photo was right against my door, and I can see him edging it away and off to the side so I'd have to fully step out and around a small corner to collect it. I keep texting him, telling him it's in a perfect spot, I'm glad he followed the instructions, and I'll be out shortly. He starts banging on my front door now, still occasionally talking to this other male voice. My food is now further away from the door. He won't stop banging and telling me to come outside. Eventually, I tell him I set delivery as no contact, as I have COVID and don't want to get anyone sick. After I saw he'd read my message on the app, he put my food back by the door and walked out of there through the back parking lot, although initially he had come in the main entrance from the front of the house. There was something about this entire encounter that felt off. I waited about 15 minutes until I couldn't see anyone or hear anyone, and I quickly opened the door and grabbed my food. The whole ordeal lasted about an hour. My food was nice and cold, the joint was out, away for another day, and my heart was racing for the rest of the night. So, delivery man who wouldn't take the hint and go away, along with his friend, let's not ever meet. The story I'm about to tell happened to me about seven years ago, but I still remember the fear that I felt like it was yesterday. When I was in my early 20s, I worked the night shift at a bakery making donuts. I loved that job. Three nights of the week, I would be with my coworker, and two nights, I would work alone. It was the summertime, and we were having some problems with the AC. So the maintenance guy, Andy, came at night when I was on the clock 
to work on it. The bakery was small and crowded during the day, so it was best for him to come when it was empty. Management always did a good job to let me know when Andy would be there, so it was never a surprise. At first, he was very pleasant, and I had no issue sharing space with him as we worked. But one evening, this all changed. My one coworker was a little bit late. She said she lost track of time in the shower. So Andy piped in saying, we should all shower together to save time, and begins laughing. It was creepy as hell. I also had stated that I lived alone, with his response being, good, I have you to myself then. After this night, I realized Andy wasn't the kind of guy I thought he was. I stopped speaking to him unless I had to, and before long, the AC was repaired, and I thought that I was free of him. Fast forward to a night a few weeks later, I'm working alone, it's nearly two in the morning. I'm trying donuts when I hear all of a sudden a loud banging on the front window. Startled, I look up and see who else but Andy. He's calling my name and asking to be let in, but nobody had told me anything about him coming that night. Andy then starts pulling on the front door handles. Luckily, they're locked. I run into a corner of the bakery where he can't see me and try calling my manager with no response. The bakery phone begins to ring and I can see the caller ID from where I'm sitting. It's Andy. He's relentlessly banging on the window and trying to pry the door open. With my fear rising, I dial 911. The cops arrive within 10 minutes and search Andy's vehicle. In the back seat, they find duct tape, a knife, and rope. They can't do anything though, quote, because he hasn't harmed me, unquote. Andy told the police he was there to fix the AC. My manager calls me back in the morning and tells me that the AC is working fine and that nobody had asked Andy to come through. Needless to say, we found a new maintenance man shortly after this and all employees were put on high alert to be on the lookout for Andy if he ever decided to come back. Thankfully, he never did and I haven't seen his face in the seven years since. But every so often, I find myself wondering what would have happened, what could have happened, if those doors were open that night. I went to the University of Buffalo, fresh out of high school in the early 2000s. At that time, the online world was a bit like the wild, wild west, which included having to do quite a bit more digging to find specific information than today's split-second Google searches. As such, it was a much easier time for colleges and universities to hide or spin campus crime statistics to make themselves look better for prospective wallets, I mean students. Case in point, I was at orientation a month or two before my freshman year, and one of the mass presentations I had to attend was about campus safety. Bright-faced upperclassmen orientation aides enthusiastically verbally filleted the school boasting about how North Campus was in, at the time, the safest town in the country, Amherst, New York, and that the only murder in recent history had occurred nine years ago to an unfortunate student named Linda Yalem, who was murdered on the campus's bike path during a lone, early morning run. It was a fate that, we were assured, could be avoided by simply not hitting the bike path alone. What they conveniently didn't reveal was that A, the killer hadn't been caught, and B, Yalem wasn't his only victim. Turns out he was a serial rapist, an eventual serial killer, who had already been active in the area for at least 25 years, in downtown Buffalo and on the secluded bike paths of the Buffalo suburbs. In retrospect, had this information been as readily accessible as it is now, it probably would have kept me from the most bone-chilling encounter of my life. Fast forward three years. I was a very depressed 20-year-old who was struggling with her sexual identity and her parents' reaction to it in a much less accepting time than now. I'd left school, and to avoid being home, shacked up with a woman who'd promised me the world, but then rejected me in favor of her ex-girlfriend on the night I moved in, and eventually turned out to be a felon who drained vulnerable would-be love interest bank accounts, though that's a very convoluted story for another time. 
So clearly, I was an unhappy young adult, desperate for love and a sense of belonging, sometimes to my own detriment. Despite my roommate's many unkind and hurtful gestures, I stuck with it in the naive hope that she would eventually come around and fulfill her pie-in-the-sky promises to me. On a particular July night, that hope just fell flat. I was at Roxy's Green Room, a now-defunct lesbian bar and club that many wayward Buffalo lesbians, myself included, flocked to at night to feel a much-needed sense of community and to hopefully land a special someone. Since the latter just wasn't happening for me, I was still stuck on my roommate. She liked to dangle emotional carrots overhead out of some sick joy that she got from making me hurt, but also to hang on to hope. And after a promise to hit Roxy's alone with me and talk about us, she showed up with her ex turned current and shut me out. I was wounded and upset enough to leave around 1 a.m., well before the 4 a.m. last call that I was still young and spry enough to stomach and without a ride home like my usually wiser self would have secured. While my apartment on Delaware was walking distance from Roxy's, it was a good half hour walk. Being as emotionally charged as I was though, I angrily hoofed it down the main street sidewalk, still managing to follow the pedestrian rule of walking against traffic despite stupidly ignoring a rule I knew well from years of watching forensic shows. If you're a woman, never leave a bar at night alone especially if you're walking. I got exactly halfway home when a dark green sedan started driving towards me. I thought nothing of it until the car slowed down near me as I walked. A lone, middle-aged man was in the car with a skin tone that I originally associated with the guy being Italian, but in retrospect, he could have easily been Puerto Rican. He had dark hair, and most importantly, almost impossibly dark eyes that seemed to hold no light of good intentions. Now I was used to guys being pigs. I'd been catcalled by downtown construction workers when an ex-girlfriend and I shared a kiss, and I had endured all matter of wholly unwanted, graphic, and ham-fisted advances from dudes at school. Although I'd never take the stance that I was, quote, asking for it, I was young and thin, so I was dressed in a tight, red crop top with flare-legged black spandex pants. The getup was meant to turn women's heads, so I wasn't exactly surprised that I caught the attention of the wrong sex. I paid it little never mind, past mild irritation that a guy old enough to be my dad would look at me like that, as the guy drove off and turned at the next intersection behind me. My walk resumed. I put the guy out of my mind, and I continued my trek. But the peace didn't last. About two or three minutes later, I see a familiar green car coming up on me again. This time, the guy's window was down a bit, and he shouted, Hey! in a beckoning manner, and gestured in a way that made me wonder if he thought I was a lady of the night. Now that incensed me. Despite my recent struggles with my identity and the resulting entropy in my life, I was always a good kid. I flashed him a quick, annoyed look to inform him that despite the mildly revealing clothing, he was barking up the wrong tree for several reasons, and then I ignored him, focusing forward. He sped off again, just to turn around once more. At that point, it was clear that the dude was casing me like a cat burglar cases a house. It was before the time of Uber or even widespread use of cell phones, and with no cabs passing by, I had little hope of getting one. Public transit existed, but it was both sparse and not running nearby. The stretches of Maine between intersections were long, and I'd probably be spotted on them anyway since the guy was circling. Being 15 minutes away from both Roxy's and my home, there was also no way I could get anywhere near either place before the green car came back around again. I quickly thumbed through my mental Rolodex of true crime show inspired safety tips that should have kept me out of this situation in the first place. Tip number one, get to an open business inform the clerk, have them call the police, and stay put. Then the guy would either give up or get caught. I was coming up on a convenience store on the opposite side of the street where I'd bought a pack of cigarettes earlier in the night. But as I got closer, the desolate blackness through the windows told me that it was closed. I looked around for something else, another bar, a gas station, anything. 
but the street was flanked by shuttered brick buildings and a locked-up church. Then came the headlights and green again. Again, the guy slowed down as he approached me, but his demeanor had shifted once more. He put his palm out impatiently, as if he couldn't understand my lack of complicity. Come on, the guy yelled through his now open window, his face an equal picture of aggression, intimidation, and frustration. I kept out of arm's reach on the sidewalk, and once again ignored him, but this time, I was properly shaken. He angrily punched the gas, and was off on his familiar circuit back around towards me. Now I knew I was in trouble. The guy's behavior was escalating, and I was genuinely scared that his next move would be to grab me off the sidewalk and pull me into his car. From there, God only knew what sort of depravity I was in for. I scrambled through my memory for another safety tip, and I remembered that making myself both impossible to ignore and obviously in distress could get me some much-needed attention from an outside party. I ran into the middle of Main Street and started frantically waving my hands and shouting at every car that was coming my way. The first car drove right by. The second car, same result. The terror in me was palpable. I knew the stories of city dwellers like Kitty Genovese, who were left to their horrible fates at the hands of monsters, by jaded throngs of people who heard the attacks perpetrated on them and their cries for help, yet did nothing out of both an assumption that someone else would step up and a reluctance to get involved. Would I be the next victim of the bystander effect, snatched away to an early end because of big city indifference? As I was beginning to lose hope, but still determined to keep trying while thinking of my next bold move, a van pulled over that had four young black men in it. As a white woman, I was relieved. I knew that statistically, male predators overwhelmingly tend to prey on women of their same race. In a game of numbers, this van full of guys was exponentially safer than that single stalker in the green car. I opted to take the gamble. I frantically told them about the man in the green car who kept circling around the block and following me, and begged for a ride home. The driver asked if I had any money in exchange for the favor. I didn't. Then he asked if I had any cigarettes. I may be one of the only people you'll ever meet who actually had her life saved by smokes. Though I had never been a smoker before, I briefly picked up the filthy habit because New York State bars still allowed smoking, and it was a weird part of Buffalo lesbian bar culture that I emulated to fit in. Yes, I answered urgently. I just bought a pack and you can have the whole thing if you get me home. Admittedly, I was initially a little miffed that the driver wanted something from me in exchange for not letting me get abducted off the street, as well as the implication that he may not have helped me if I had nothing. But still, I had the Marlboros, he had a vehicle, and the stars had hopefully aligned. Regardless of how it went down, I had help if he let me in, and the details didn't matter. After a second or two of thought, which seemed like an eternity to me, The driver agreed and one of the two dudes in the back opened the side door for me and got out so I could slide into the seat behind the driver. As the door to my safe carriage full of impromptu nights shut and I buckled myself in, I looked out my window just in time to see the green car creeping past the van and proving to my saviors that I was telling a very disturbing true story. Until my dying day, I will never forget that man's eyes. Feeling safe surrounded by a closed van full of young, tough-looking rescuers, I looked that bastard dead in his eyes. Part of me was rightfully terrified, but another part of me wanted to look right at him defiantly and tell him with my eyes, I got away from you. I win. I was repaid with the most evil, hateful look that I've ever had directed at me, let alone seen. His eyes were black. Black like a cat's eyes get when it sees a bug in the house and its hunting instincts turn on. But at least there's usually a hint of playful mischief in a hunting cat's eyes. The eyes I was seeing were those of a pure, unadulterated predator, and the vitriol that practically oozed from them as he glared at me to let me know exactly how he felt about having his prey having the audacity to elude him. He drove off into the night, and so did we, in a bit less direct of a route to make sure that we lost him. After a blessedly quick jaunt, with frequent looks behind my shoulder, I was delivered home, one pack of cigarettes short, 
but alive and in one piece. The first thing that I did when I got in the door was to check that the locks on absolutely everything were engaged. After that, the adrenaline started to wear off and the fear set in. I was so terrified that the man in the green sedan was searching the area where I got dropped off that I grabbed the cordless phone, then lay completely flat on the living room floor for hours to keep totally out of sight from any of my apartment windows. As I lay there, I called the Buffalo police and relayed my terrifying tale in as much detail as I could give them. Being painfully aware of the prevalence of hate crimes against the LGBT community, I told the cops that it was possible that the man was cruising near Roxy's to prey on vulnerable queer women. In hindsight though, I think the guy just saw who he thought was an easy mark out by herself and availed himself of the opportunity to strike. Fast forward another four years, and I'd moved out to Chicago to live with my then girlfriend. For about half of my four years there, I was pretty homesick. I'd never lived anywhere except my home state of New York, and I went there knowing no one except for my ex, who wasn't exactly an empathetic soul, adding to my feelings of isolation. I coped by keeping up on upstate New York news, so I'd feel a little less far away. On a chilly mid-January morning in 2007, I was at our computer looking up headlines from my home state when one from WBFO popped up that immediately snared my attention. Bike Path Rapist is Arrested. By then, I knew the moniker well. The internet had since aged into a beautifully organized repository of knowledge, and despite the lack of transparency from my alma mater, I became familiar with the Buffalo area mystery man and his active status throughout my time in Buffalo. Now I had a name for the specter responsible, for that bit of eeriness that was always in the back of my mind when I was a student. The bike path rapist was revealed as Altemio Sanchez, a middle-aged native of Puerto Rico who coached his son's sports teams and was affectionately referred to as Uncle Al in his neighborhood. As with many other killers, his disguises were his community involvement and just being ordinary. The man was estimated to have been responsible for 9 to 15 assaults around the Buffalo area since 1975 and had confessed to three murders, the Yalem murder in 1991, a second in 1992, and a third which had occurred only three and a half months prior to his capture. I don't know if you've ever felt your heart somehow get wedged up into your voice box and get dropped into the depths of your stomach simultaneously, but believe me when I say that it's possible, given the right catalyst. For me, that was the printed proof that the man was active while I lived in Buffalo and frequented Roxy's. More so, I knew that serial killers rarely take breaks as lengthy as the one between his 1992 and 2006 killings. He had to have been at least attempting to sate his evil impulses for those 14 years. That realization gave me a very bad feeling that I'd cross paths with someone much more dangerous than I had realized. The news article had no picture of Sanchez, but the sickening feeling inside me urged me to find one. It was almost as if I knew what I would see before I even looked at him. I searched his name, and I was horrified, though not surprised, to see those same black, soulless, predatory eyes that I looked into four times on that summer night in Buffalo back in 2003. The timeline fit, my profile as a victim fit, if he did, in fact, mistake me for a downtown prostitute, and barring all else, I knew those eyes. I had a potentially deadly close encounter with Altemio Sanchez, the bike path rapist, aka the bike path killer. My lack of sense put me in his orbit, and a van of angels pulled me out of it. I know who I saw, and as God is my witness, I will never be convinced otherwise. Though many of his acts, fell victim to various statutes of limitation. Altemio Sanchez pled guilty to the three murders and was sentenced to 75 years to life in prison. In essence, the guy won't be exposed to the outside again unless he's in a body bag. So, Altemio, even if you're worm food and being wheeled out in a bag on a prison gurney, I'll take that encounter that we had many years ago and be thankful that I never had the opportunity to meet you.